Hello world, welcome to Comic Book News. I'm Dan Shaheen. Wow, man. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for checking us out. I've got a repeat guest, a really exciting one. One of my first guests. He was my first big get, if you will. And I still consider him my big get. Still haven't asked all the questions that I wanna ask. And I had a long, long, sometimes described as rambling interview with the guy. Uh, and this was uh, I don't know, well over a year ago, before the Jeppy stream, before the controversial streams of late. He said some really nice things to me about the show he, because he became, he's not just like was a guest. He's one of those guys who's come back and watches the show. He's one of those guys who watches the show live sometimes and comments. He's one of those guys who's got opinions. He's not afraid to share. But frankly, he's got a, a, a body of work that backs it up and, and speaks for itself. Who am I talking about? Elliot R. Brown, the notorious ERB. Now, I've talked to some people, very, very knowledgeable people about comics. Very, very knowledgeable about Marvel comics. About Marvel comics of the 1980s. And I said, well, you must love Elliot R. Brown. And they said, who? Not not all of them. The of course those you know at the deepest levels. Of course they know, but there were people that really surprised me. They go, you know, all those diagrams and stuff in the official handbook of the Marvel Universe. You know, the Quinjet in exacting detail. Like those things, they didn't just like go to the Avengers file, like Tony Stark's files, and pull them out. You know what I mean? Like somebody drew them. Somebody thought about it. Somebody researched it. Somebody took a lot of time to take, get the draftsman skills to draw those in a technically, if not 100% accurate and realistic way, one that was pretty convincing to 10-year-old Danny Shaheen. Let me, I'm just going to, I'll say that, okay? I probably was really first introduced to his work heavily through the Marvel Universe role-playing game. Now, these guys were no dummies. They saw realistically rendered to scale drawings and diagrams and maps and equipment descriptions. And they said, nom, 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 this is my bread and butter. This is my work. This guy's done our work for us. And he wasn't getting royalties on that stuff, as far as I know. So it's just like Marvel owned that stuff. And they're just like, yeah, oh, yeah, the Quinjet thing. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and use that. I don't know who, how many people realize like the level of authenticity that brought to like people coming from the outside who looked at those, like myself. It, it brought the Marvel Universe and what was going on there, it just a different level. I mean, Marvel compared to DC, I was a Marvel kid. Marvel was like imaginary cities and 
you know, magical words that turn you into whatever, you know, Marvel was like a cohesive universe set in our universe, grounded in more or less real technology, or at least the technology of the day, you know, and, and Stan Lee was many things, but technical expert, he was not. And, uh, you know, transistors did an awful lot back in those days. Let me just say the transistor, um, really pulled off a lot of interesting tricks for both Iron Man and, and many other people. So it wasn't until um, Mr. Brown came along and started putting out these diagrams. If you've ever seen the, the, the architectural diagram of the, 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 the Baxter building and then later, I guess, the Four Freedoms Plaza, you're looking at a, a, a really epic work of like, I don't know what you call it, scientific imagineering. I don't know, taking what's in firmly in Jack Kirby's imagination and taking it and going like, taking that stylized representation and turning it into something that you could like imagine as being totally 100% real. So <clears throat> maybe he should be, it should be extremely real Brown, right? That's Elliot R. Brown for you because that's what he does. So. We're gonna bring him in in a second, but I gotta take care of a little show business first. Thank you for watching and subscribing. If you haven't already, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Man, I need subscribers. We're at over 2,000 and we're climbing, we're going away, but man, it's not doesn't just happen. I recognize that I am responsible for putting out content that people are gonna enjoy and watch. So I work as hard as I have, as hard as I can to bring the most interesting people to me. I mean, ultimately, this show is to please me. But one of my favorite things has been reaching out to the comics community and getting stuff sent to me. Right. To where? The million dollar mailbox, of course. Please, if you've got comics and you want them reviewed or talked about on this show, then you want to send them to Comic Book News, P.O. Box, 1163 Arcata, California, 95518. We'll put it on the million dollar mailbox. Maybe we'll bring in Larry Young. Maybe we'll bring in somebody else. We'll take a look at it. We'll hype it, dude. We'll, we'll, we'll watch it. And we'll wa look at them all on the show. We'll talk about it. I'll chop it up into clips, give them out. You can send those around and increase the love. It's all we're trying to do here. All right. Speaking of love, now it's time for me to bring in my original first big get and favorite. Um, you know him, you love him, Mr. Technical. Elliot R. Brown. Hey. Elliot, welcome back <laughs> to Comic Book News. Good to see you again, old timer. Did I ramble too long? I'm sorry. No. no. <laughs> I'm giving everybody a chance to jump on board because I tried to spread the word and the love that you're coming back, Elliot. Welcome back. Appreciate it. And I appreciate anybody who ever saw these things because um, I usually don't do this. Uh, I'm, uh, it's not that I haven't been asked because I haven't been asked, but um, I, I don't, I don't like talking about this stuff. I know that's not, you know after we've talked. I don't. I'm I'm worried I'm going to say the wrong thing. The worst part about living through the reality of the day to day and. The, the hundreds of people who were in and out of the office all the time. So you might make a mistake and, you know, say something that somebody doesn't want out there. You just never know. So I usually, I try to, I try to not talk about the past, but however, Dan, you had some questions. Go ask me, Start, wind me up. Let me go. I, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Well, Elliot, you know, we talked man at length about your, like your whole career, where it began, where it went. I'm, I'm going to just say, look, check out the link right up there. And it'll go to Elliot, to our old interview with Elliot. And you can take a look at some of that stuff. And what I want to get into today, man, is, is since you've expressed a willingness to talk, and I, I want to go deep on a, a, a piece of your career that I don't think a lot of people talk about. I wanted to talk a, a little bit about uh, the Punisher Armory. I want to, you know, because as a gun nut, I don't know if you know this, I take all of the money and I make a lot of money. On comic book news, a lot. Buying guns takes a lot of money. <laughs> all I right. take it all and I put it into weapons. Uh, and and when I'm not thinking about comics and thinking about weapons, I'm doing push-ups, man, because I took my lessons. That's right. From Frank. Oh wait, you can tell this is not real. <laughs> um, I just gave it all away. Damn it! That's 
that's why that's why mine mine has a you know only the Kanye. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, buddy. <laughs> so, the lesson that I learned, the reason I love the Punisher armory, yes, and why I want to talk about it so much, is because it just took this approach. I mean, the Punisher is Batman made real, right? Yeah. It's like Batman, for as much as people say you could really be Batman, you really cannot be Batman. No, no. Well, okay. Here's the, here's the problem. Sure you could. It's a question of motivation. And the basic, the basic original pat problem is you have to be pretty smart. You have to have a nice high IQ and you have to have an early trauma. And and an unnatural focus, and then you can be Batman. Okay, but wait, Batman had one other thing. He inherited independent wealth. He had a source of income, right? Uh, well, the Punisher Armory made me think about where does he get all this money? Well, yes. you knock over your first drug cartel and you take all their their bags of dough and you know launder it properly, and you've got a couple of million bucks. That's a good start. My wife and I are constantly, we, we love watching these modern spy movies where uh, somebody goes into a, an apartment building and opens up a studio and that's that's their, it's one of five places they've got. Well, wait, 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 wait just a minute now. It's not like they busted into a random apartment. Phony names, storefronts, uh, cutouts. you got to have five different levels of ownership to hide it from the, what? but you got to keep all the bills going. You have to keep the money rolling in. That's a lot of paperwork. And, that's that's a real criminal mastermind. <laughs> it's figuring all that. Well, well, yeah, there's that. There's the financial end, but you also thought about like other things, like like what is the Punisher's personal fitness regimen like? You know, and I grew like, up what and like what kind of gun would the Punisher take when he goes jogging? Like those were the kind of questions you literally explored. You yeah. went into every facet of like what this guy's life would have to be like and what he would have to teach himself to do what he did. And I, I, I tried real hard. It, you know, I'm, I'm, I like guns, but I lived in midtown Manhattan when I wrote the Punisher and you can't, you just couldn't have guns in midtown. It was wildly expensive. I mean, the best, the best dodge was to buy a collectible like a Colt 45 and uh, join a gun club. And, and you have to go re 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 religiously, regularly, I'm trying to say regularly, and uh, and shoot $250 worth of, of ammunition every weekend, every month at least. Right. You've got to stay proficient or don't have a gun. That's the problem with gun ownership. you really got to maintain it. Huh. That's, the, that's what I really thought. That's one of the things I learned about uh, you know, the great... The, the policemen I read about, the couple of cops I got to know, uh, weapon specialists of all kinds, really. Um, it was it was how much time they had to spend taking apart their weapons, oiling it, putting it back over and over, faster and faster. It, it was fascinating, but it's a lifestyle that I was not ready to commit to because you, that, you, you ain't whistling Dixie. That is a lifestyle. That's something. Um, I got there was a around the third or fourth issue. All of a sudden, I hear, hey, this crazy guy came in the office and he's looking for you. And, uh, geez, he says you've infringed on his copyright and his, his trademark. Oh, okay, who's this guy? Great. He, okay. Um, uh, Drew Parmenter was a state trooper up around here where I live now in upstate New York. And uh, so we all, we talked about the same neighborhood with, with, with equal familiarity. And he had been retired, uh, but he was gun nut. Is, is a question begging term. He was a pistol enthusiast. He was a weapons expert. He was an NRA trainer. I mean, you know, he was a more serious gun person. Um, he took me out to a range. Uh, uh, I shot off a, a street sweeper. You know, I shot off a semi-automatic, uh, a, a hunting rifle, a sniper rifle. I mean, it was really impressive. And he just, here, he just hands over a, a five, uh, a, a, I don't know if you remember, there was a modification to a, cult, uh, a government model 45 where you could rebuild the entire lower receiver. And it, what it did was instead of this, the Colt has the inline magazine of straight uh, 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 cartridges, this had an 18 round 
magazine with an entirely rebuilt handle. He had three of them. He handed them over. He said, go ahead, try them all. Because they, they were race guns, different levels of race guns. And he said, and he opened, unrolls a, a, a little a little olive drab kit full of a dozen magazines full of uh, 45s. Go ahead, shoot them all. He showed me his reloading setup. I mean, this is, and his his normal. Okay, so here's, here's what's going on. Yeah, Colt 45. Uh, 45, yeah. Here's, here's what's funny. Okay, let me, I don't want to digress too far away from this, but. Um, Go. The funniest thing about this guy, he made his money day to day by putting, he hired people who would do the work. He would be the in-between and he'd make all the money and pay them. These little electronic shops in midtown Manhattan, they were on the west side. If you walk by Times Square, you see a, a wall, a glass wall of these little display pieces where there's a little camera mounted on a thing. It says immediate action, uh, uh, HD quality, all hand lettered. He's the guy who did that his entire window. He was oh, oh. Made an incredible amount of money, which I was, that blew my mind. This is in the 90s when they were all over the place. I don't know what's going on now. I haven't been in the city in a while. So he gave me a wild experience all at once. And I got all of the information from him. He said one thing that always impressed me. He used to carry a, uh, a very small piece all the time. He had a wafer wallet um, on, the, on his belt. And uh, <coughs> you, you know, you, you'd never know it was there. And um, he said, you got to be of a mindset to do this. Because if you're carrying something like this, it changes your outlook. It changes the way you face a situation. That was interesting. That makes sense. Sure. And if you're if you're of the type who can't involve, you've got to be ready to commit. You don't pull your piece unless you're real experienced. And that's bad. Because you know, that means you've got to start talking at some point. It was a very interesting conversation. Uh he was he was the real deal. Now the last thing he did, uh, he was only licensed, fully automatic supplier of PV and prop weapons on the East Coast. And oh. he did all the guns and law and order. That was a few years ago, so I don't know what he's doing right now. Probably basking on a you know Caribbean island somewhere. Could be could be freezing his butt off in Long Island too. You know I don't, I have no idea. I love that guy. He's a crazy guy. I crazy. seem to remember. Didn't you do some work at a prop making shop? Didn't we talk I about in? I did. And, um, uh, in fact, the thing Adam Savage from MythBusters and I have in common is that we worked at the same place. Literally, I think he must have been kicked out right ahead of me because I came in and I saw this beautiful work all around me. He had somebody, I think it was him, had lettered the initials of the of the guy all over the place. And I'm thinking back, I recognize the handwriting now. It's a long time ago, but yes, probably he was uh, Peter Wallach uh, Enterprises. Peter Wallach was Eli Wallach's kid, if you can believe that. His son, huh? Genius kid, genius kid, wonderful place. He did. Um, uh, commercials uh, and little local stuff in Midtown Manhattan, downtown. Sorry, downtown Manhattan. And the biggest thing he had done uh, just before I got there was this massive head of a Gundam robot, where some kid got on the thing's shoulder and talked to it. And they had a guy from the Henson shop in there yanking the head around, puppeteering, uh -huh. gigantic head, talking to this kid. Forming the the inner you know the in between section the linking sections of this of this cartoon this, this show. I actually saw it before they ripped it out. I was in there one day and then the, the, over the weekend it was gone. That was fascinating. That was fun. So he was probably involved in. This. But what I got involved with was um, they had um, they were doing Star Trek Five. They were like the second removed level of. They were an independent contractor for the main guy, which was Ferran and Associates. Uh, doing uh, 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 Starfields, and I got to see the original 11 foot, 7 foot, whatever the hell it was, uh, shooting model of the Enterprise, the refit. Oh, cool. So the Klingon ship, uh, it was, we were out in, they were out in New Jersey. I was in Manhattan, and there was a daily commute back and forth. So you could sometimes go out there for fun. And I went out there, and it was this candy factory, <laughs> an abandoned candy factory that they took over. Uh, and uh, they had a motion control rig because they needed to make a couple of shots with that model that had been shipped across country in a truck, both of them actually. I love, I just that was a crazy time. That was so much fun. Um, I did a lot of things that I would never have imagined. I worked 
they dragged this poor German engineer out of retirement, Gunther, of course, and he and I helped adjust this uh, uh, this camera stand that was a motor controlled, a motor driven camera stand run by a basic computer, and it was a VistaVision camera stand. And it was twenty feet tall. It, it the camera was as big as, as as this. It was enormous. It was so much fun to. Well, he was Okay, now you go down, go down, down. Okay, you untighten them one turn, no more than one turn, and tighten them back up in order. One, five, nine, seven. Okay, okay, Gunther, amazing. I love that guy. So Dude. now this was all a after after leaving Marvel, correct? Yes, I was I was escorted out in uh, uh, eighty six, mid eighty six, and this took place around eighty eight. I languished for a couple yeah. of years. A little freelance. So how much did your reputation precede you going into those? Like, how much was your portfolio and what you were able to do at Marvel? Was Did that, like, get you entree into this new career at all? Did that do anything for you? It was Larry Hama. <laughs> Larry Hama was all they needed to, to hear. They were, they, ah. Larry Hama's very close friend, Michael Sullivan, who was a master model maker, genius, crazy model maker. And, you know, one of these gifted problem solver model makers, not just an ordinary model maker. Um, yes. Uh, he worked at Peter Wallace for years, and when he needed somebody, which I presume Mr. Savage you know, took a powder, um, he uh, he called Larry, who was his friend, and Larry says, "Well, Elliot Brown is, isn't working. I yeah, go find him." That's what I I did, and uh, that's that was all the intro I needed. I, I came in, I showed up a couple of things. It didn't matter what I showed up that day. It, it, I was never I never drew so much as a stick of uh, you know, I picked up a pencil for the whole time I was there. Huh. That's, it's just, it, but it was fun, you know. That's among my interests were were uh, uh, television production and motion picture production. So right. that was fun. I helped. Solve so you it. must have worked with a lot of cameras then in your time. Oh yeah, I worked with a lot of cameras. Yeah, and those cameras must have cost a lot of money. All my money. Would you say any of them did? Do you see where I'm going with this, Elliot? Do you think? I, I don't know what you're. What are you trying to say with this line? Of, well, because. Because, well, we do a thing around here with cameras that cost a lot of money. You know what we call that thing? I think you do. Yeah. Hells, bells, million dollar comic cam. Oh, so, yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately uh -oh. I, had, I had to reboot this thing. So I'm having a little bit of a problem with my uh -oh. visual camera itself. But let me see if I can do something here. I think I can. Yeah. This is a new, whole new methodology. Oh, I love it. This is where we're going. Okay. Awesome. So. What have we got here? Million dollar comics cam. Uh, a few things from the Elliot R. Brown Ouvoir. One, I wanted to point out for sure. We're going to talk about Punisher Armory in a second, sure. but I really wanted to look at. Um, I really wanted to look at this for a second. Talk that's about that's this because this is the first time when you got some shine. That was a real treat. That was a shocker that anybody remembered me literally i hadn't spoken about comics i said you know i used to work for marvel comics and i'm, I'm sounding like you know some of the crackpot dusty abel dusty abel who was a, a an animator and a pretty damn good artist uh, he's, he's working, um, pretty sure he's working on uh, he's done a lot of work at, at on ben 10 that uh which is a uh, yeah okay as long as anybody knows about it i've only seen a little bit of it because of dusty and he says Oh, it's a great show. It, it was a really cool show, as I remember. I didn't watch a lot of it, but it was a cool show. Well received. He's prominent in it. And um, he asked if I would do a page for his Invincible. Invincibles? I think it's Invincibles. He wanted to do a, a, a pian, a tribute to the Marvel Universe uh, for his line of books. And I said, sure. And he sent me some information, and I, I, I did the page for him. And that was a very pleasant experience. And... Um, you know, I wasn't used to doing the work. It's very, it's very hard for me to actually do the work anymore because uh, I'm not really set up for it. It's, it's, it's not obvious, but it's hard to bend over and do twitchy little things anymore. It's just very difficult. And I did, you know, all of those pages took thousands of hours. Um, he also said, "Would you like to do back issue?" And I, well, I knew the book. So I said, okay, fine. Well, you know, what do you got in mind? He says, well, I want you to do the cover. I mean, he's like, I mean, I happen to know the editor too. That's a whole you know, that's a different story. 
And uh, so he says, yeah, great. You, you do the cover. It's great. And and so he suggested, now, this is what's amazing about, about, about Justin. He does this all himself. I did the artwork, but he threw all this together out of junk found around the internet. I mean, for all I know, it's his own private stuff. That cover he put together, he did it in minutes flat. Literally, he showed me a, a mock-up, and then he showed me a couple of things he was doing, and then half hour later, it was done. He's that. It was all all of the, the lettering had been isolated, and all of the coloring had been toned and great. It was, it was yeah, amazing. It's it's great looking uh, stuff, but you know it. it and what it captures is though the level of detail of like what it means to be Elliot R. Brown and, and what it means to. Got to admit this. He, he suggested the Spidey mobile because he said that's the one they never did. And I said, yeah, that was that, that. We never even talked about it back in the day. Um, there was no room for a lot of things. That's that's the real trouble. With the Spidey mobile. It needed some. Let me, well, let's let's talk vehicles and let's talk about like fan favorite, Dan favorite. <laughs> Dan favorite. Come on, let's talk about this. It, it was you who pointed out that Hot Wheels, Hot Wheels was, was Oh cool. yeah. And I, I think I got one here. Yeah. And the thing is, the thing that blows my mind is they followed this drawing. They, yes. they, they whoever did this work really I I still don't believe it. I just don't believe it. I mean I Oh, that 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 was fun. I, I'm only sorry that they didn't send me a a, a freebie because you know. I, I don't know. Well, Elliot, I've got I've got one of those. That's real. Sorry. But do you have? I don't know that I have mine here. Do you have the limited edition version with the black paint? I chose not to buy it. Okay. I, you know what? Now the only thing I didn't like about this. No, they put is that they it is that this does not seem very stealthy for the Punisher to have put his Bell logo on there. A little silly. Hey, uh, what, what can I tell you? You know, it's it's the Doc Savage belt buckle from the movies all over again. Right, right. But they and they didn't show. You know, they didn't even show. You never showed the other side of the van in your diagram. So I guess it's all right. I guess it's. So they got a chance to. Uh, um, I showed it in plan view. On another page, in in uh, elevation, so they could they could see it all. But I never did have the uh, the, the logo on it. No. <laughs> no. Very beautiful book, Elliot, or a very beautiful design. Tell me about the thought that went into this. Like, who told you what to put in the Punisher's van? Um, the only uh, this at this point this was not Don Daly. This was Carl Potts, and Carl, who was doing something with the uh, the armory. Uh, not the uh, Punisher at that point. And the only thing he said was that there there was some kind of an anti-burglar gadget. I don't know what he meant by that. So I designed this crazy thing uh, in the um, in the back. It's the little curly arms, which is made out of memory wire. That grabs yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that grabs people and clenches down on them. Because it's memory wire. It's a nitinol, which is one of those... So those wires that you, when you heat it up, it adopts a new shape. So it can actually, uh -huh. muscle. It's, a, it's a mechanical muscle. Um, it's used in experiments involving um, insect muscle frequency. That's that's the kind of, you know, crazy stuff I remember. Um, and how many transistors did it take to, does it? You know, no man can say. You know, they shrink those transistors down an awful lot these days. You know, <laughs> transistors, when he did the first Iron Man, Transistors were four years old. Four years old. Okay. That's, That's reasonable. That's pretty reasonable. They were used in the Air Force uh, missile control systems, but they were gigantic. They were as big as the end of your thumb. I mean, they were just huge uh, back in those days. And there was only three. What about this little guy, Elliot? Yeah, that's another one. That had been shown in the books already. So I tried to, you know, okay, fine. Somebody had seen that Dirty Harry movie where uh, somebody ran the RC car under uh, under the bad guys, under the good guys. Deadpool, the Deadpool. Well, I think was the was that movie. I think that's right. And so, that, so that. 
Okay. Now, I, I wanna, we'll come back. We'll come back. To that I just wanted to see, point this out. These are these are prints that you sent me, Elliot. When when I told you how much I wanted to buy some original artwork from you, you're like, I don't know about that, Dan. But I'm still working on it, buddy. I'm not saying no. Yeah, I'm not saying. Tell no. me, but tell me what you, you what you created these for, what you use them, and and can people? How could somebody else who wants some Elliot R. Brown artwork? Where could they buy something like this? Oh, okay. Funny story. So Let's uh, page through these while you're talking. Okay, you go ahead. Talking to uh, the, of the very nice publisher at Marvel. He, I was a, a very cordial conversation about a year ago. Uh, no, two years ago. What am I saying? Two years ago by now, because I went to the California con, the last one, and I said, I said to the guy, you know, I'm bringing uh, a bunch of prints to sell, and he goes. No, no, you can't say that to me. No, what do you even don't say the word? No, no. I then found out that for the previous 35, 40 years, whenever I would go to a convention and look at people selling prints of their artwork, they were breaking the law. They were violating Marvel's code. I had no idea. And I'd worked in the business, you know, it's no idea. Apparently, you can only sell original artwork. If you make a print, you're violating their trademark possibilities. I mean, that makes sense, right? You signed away the reproduction rights for your for your artwork. It does, God bless me, but how else am I supposed to make money? You can only sell those pages. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. totally. So anyway, so that's why you know, I was very happy to send them to you for free. It just that you know, m money money crossing hands is so unsavory, and I, I you know I'm not against it. That's just that you know, depends. All I'm saying is that this is beyond, this is not like reproducing the page because this is almost like an artist's edition in some ways. I mean, it, it was an expensive copy. I put it on good paper and it's full size. It captures all, this is if you held the original board up, that's what you'd see. Thank you so much. I, these are treasured pieces of my collection. It's those I really, I mean, they're really meaningful. And if nothing else like this, this to me is a is a holy grail type piece of artwork that I don't know that I I can afford what I think it deserves to sell for if that makes sense. I I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Um, I think you do. I think you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk. We'll talk. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Um, I mean, uh, okay, you can have this one, but we'll talk about money later. It won't be for a lot. Because, oh man, are you kidding me? You know the trouble is, I'm you know I just turned sixty six. What am I supposed to hold on to these for another twenty years? Come on, I, that's the real that's the real problem. If somebody really likes it, they should have it. Well, these are beautiful and iconic. And and before we go back, we'll go we'll go into Punisher War Journal. I want to look at two other things though that I brought. I don't have my official handbook, of the Marvel Universe, but I do have this. We talked about this a lot on the last. Oh yeah episode okay. or on our last interview um this was a favorite of mine as growing up as a kid like this was not as a kid this was like right, right as young adulthood i think um right as i'm leaving high school this this was this blows me away this was a lot a lot of work i've got to admit this was a lot um i was lucky so nelson yamtov who was, uh, you know, it's a great name for a really great guy. He was an editor at that point. He says, hey, Elliot, I need an Iron Man book. It's just like the Punisher Armory. I said, oh, all righty. And I, I, then I immediately went home and started crying because I realized just how much work this was going to take. This was four months of straight drafting and, and sketching and doodling and figuring out. Well, to figure wait out a minute. And, and writing. Right, and because writing. this is not this is a, a, this is so this is beyond your old gig was like Elliot, give us a diagram. This is put what? us in the head of the guy that built Iron Man and marry it with cutting edge research of the day and give us something. Yeah, yeah I actually I did well. I triple E the uh, the International Electrical Engineer uh, uh, Association. Um, yeah, had a magazine that I really loved. And they, they had lunatics talking about stuff all the time. And I just, I grabbed a word or two and I threw it in. And I, you know, thanks to them, I sound like a genius, but I'm not. <laughs> I just know who to rip off. Well, 
I'm just gonna say it take it, it it took a lot of smarts just to read this, Elliot. Like I felt like you know this was not easy. A lot of this was not easy stuff. A lot of this was. It seems so. It seems like science fiction, and then you start, and then as I as I learn more about it, I'm like, man, this is all stuff that I, I started reading about later when I got into college. Very little of it. The 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 science fiction. I didn't go far enough. I really did not. Yeah. This was this was a this was a loafer page. This is where I got to you know I got to I got to sleep and do this. That's that's a you know I'm ashamed of that page. It's sweet, but who cares? You know I, you know Tony Tony's office is a big deal. Um, well, you know what? Wait a minute. I want to give it. You got it's got a little designer touch, a little like rugged industrial chic. I think I, it was a good. I, I I wanted to be an architect when I was a kid. I, that was that's nothing. That's that's child. Uh -huh. And that's, it shows, man. See now there now that's the page. This this the page on the left. That was a that was a breakthrough for me. Um, it was one of the early pages that I did, and uh, I realized that there would have to be a clean room to put this together because the suit works, the suit's articulation, the suit seals, um, the, the multi-layers of materials all had to be clean room. Good. They, they couldn't just be dust-free. They had to be pollen-free. They had to be everything-free, virus-free. It had to be perfect. So that's when I figured out there had to be an assembly device, hands-off, no human hands involved, all robotic. And that's the which page. is all canon, which is all canon now for yeah. Iron Man. But I don't, I, I don't think anybody even thought of that then. Back then, it was like you had a wrench, you had your transistor wrench, and you're in your cave. Yes, well, you know, I'm, God bless David Michael Liney, Mickey, Mickey Liney, Michael Liney. He's a good guy. He's a smart guy. Oh yeah. But, uh, he was not very technically oriented. He, he, and right. Bob Layton, Bob Layton is good with a pencil and a pen, and 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 I love Bob, but you know. Let's just say he can talk his way out of a, a, a cold martini faster than uh, he can come up with a technical uh, page for Iron Man. <laughs> so that's that's Bob. Well, here's now. That, so here you're multidisciplinary, Elliot, because you got your technical drawings. These are really like life dra drawings in some ways, and then you get into your architectural stuff. Yeah. Um, this is where your passion. You just said you, you came up wanting to be an architect, and man, it's just your passion for it shows right here. Yeah, that was, I mean, the building had been designed for me, but I, I needed to go inside and try to figure it out and then show the parts of it that aren't, you know, visible and try to relate the inside and the outside. Which is the common theme of an Elliot R. Brown. That is the theme of your work. Like you didn't design almost anything on from the outside that you are so famous for. I was I was very lucky to only do it a few times. Uh, I was, that, that was a good thing. But I, yeah, but going, going I mean, the, the, the original Quinjet, and I have no idea who originally designed it. Maybe John Byrne. I don't know. Um, uh, the one that had the giant glass uh, 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 windscreen that was big yeah. enough to have five five seated pilots and and crew uh, and passengers. Um, uh, that's you know, I would never have designed anything that looked like that. And I'll tell. I'll give you a secret. I don't know if I passed on the secret last time. The Quinjet has seven engines, but don't don't tell anybody. <laughs> well you know like it yep. is a i think it's one of the more beautiful sci-fi like i really love the the old quinjet design um just the way it looks it just looks like this plane that superheroes would fly you know what i mean so um, yeah uh, let me point out something about this book one of the most important things about this book was i asked for christy shield to color it my favorite colors for my techie stuff andy yankis was not available and Andy is a genius in his own right, a colorist. You know, he, he he's the only one who did right by my my old drawings throughout the Marvel universe. But Christy is an artist. What's interesting about this book is that it's all in pastel, the very rare yeah. art. Yes, book. because she is she's a fine artist, and she has a greater uh, a greater palette than an ordinary comic book. This was also at a point in time when we had seventy five percent color value available and k-tones uh 10 and, and 20 uh, 25 percent values so that we could get real metallic look out of out of a, a color uh simple colored pages it was a very impressive uh achievement on her part that she took this stuff she didn't know what she was looking at i mean christy's as technical as a, as a, as a parrot you know, she, she, and she's beautiful and she knows it 
Um, <laughs> so she ain't no parrot, but she's not. Um, she's not technically aware. Oh, I was also had to, happy to get Stan to write something in the back. Uh, that also was very nice. Oh, he, he he signs a little something on the inside. I appreciated that because I really, you know, we. Nice. That's that's just the end of the beginning and end of it. None of this would be here without Stan. As oh, man. Let's... he was, it was Stan that that you know his crazy ideas got us here. We're nowhere without him, you know for sure. Yeah, and you can you can hate Stan all you want, but he's the guy. He is still the man. Yeah, you hate Stan, you hate yourself. Is what I'm saying because like you can't love Marvel Comics and say you cannot say Stan Lee was not integral. He wasn't solo, obviously he wasn't the only part, but he's, we've gone back and forth to from too much credit to not enough credit. And I think it's right there in the middle. He was a a man of many talents. A man of many talents. Um he I still um you ha you have to remember that he was he was a wartime soldier. He he was in World War II. Even if he didn't see action as you and I think of it as action um right he was he was in the advertising part of it so he actually he drew down deep from inside to write his pitches and when you have captain america punching the red skull splinters flying it's a it's a giant page that kirby drew and there's a giant clot of of nothing but propaganda i got a little misty yeah I mean, yeah, I, when those guys wrote about war and drew Kirby drew war scenes, it was like, yeah, that was not just like, you know, Stan, Stan flew a desk, but Kirby, Kirby was in the shit. That's what I mean. That, like, it wasn't coming from some movie he saw or, or some book that he read. Right. Um, let's talk. So let's talk. Speaking of glorified war for kids. Okay. Perfect segue. Okay. You know what? This was a strange book. I looked at this thing and I said, I needed the money. This was literally the month I'd gotten fired. And so I said, okay, great. I, how can I do this? So they they gave me the toys and catalogs, Ooh. but they didn't have the toys. And I came to the conclusion I had to invent a whole new way of drawing because up to this point in my career, I only drew isometrics. I drew uh, uh, specific angles and I used a specific set of templates that match those angles. These guys are all in perspective. What I did was, and I said, okay, I, I got to do this. I got to, got to think. I got to, I got to change my brain because I had to do thirty pages in 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 a month. I mean, I it, this was that fast, and um, all of this was done with with the same instruments. But now I used. I actually went out and I bought a new set of uh, ellipse templates that were teeny tiny really itsy bitsy and i it opened up all of my drawing abilities uh, that's one of the reasons the armory is is as good as these are because oh. this was the evolution up to the armory which took a okay to, to, to show wow. up wow that makes me even more of a genius for bringing this in before we pull in armory i mean i always thought though some of these gi joe toy designs are very inspired like Really cool designs, neat science fiction-y with a little bit of reality in there. Very ERB type designs, I would think. You put a minigun on a motorcycle, you're out of your mind. But you put a, you put a <laughs> couple of more weapons platforms on an A10, and yeah, there it is. Uh, it kind of looks like a tank buster, but it's not. <laughs> you know, Dude, but I wanted one of these Rattlers as a kid so bad. I really wanted that. And you know what? I still hate to this day tank treads. Tank treads and tire treads. Look at those things. Uh, Look at them. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. Horrible. Well, this was your trial by fire. Well, this I, got I, ready. Got another set of treads. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Oh, help. Help me. Yeah. Well, so you so you got into like, you're like, okay, I got to draw in perspective. Really, this is challenging stuff, right? To get the angles right. Because it only, yeah. it's only like when it's wrong, does is somebody going to notice it? It's only when it's absolutely perfect does no one notice anything oh, about it. got the wrong part right. There's one page that still embarrasses me. I'm not going to point it out because I love myself. Ah. Right. Yeah, come on, Ellie. We're all pals here. Did we ah. pass it already? Just tell us that. And one time, okay. we, so 
one of the things we did was uh, we used to go to Ralph's pool. Ralph Macchio, the editor, uh, lived in New Jersey, and we'd go over to his folks' uh, place and, and horse around uh, in his pool. And we took one of the G.I. Joe tanks, put the batteries in it, and just ran it right, just turned it on and let it run up to the edge and sink to the bottom of the pool, and it just kept going on the bottom. You know, uh, I never noticed this until this second, Elliot. Oh, what is this? I've never... This retract. Oh. This is the entire final page of the book. This yeah. is the entire final page. It has a caption that says the the character of Rocky Balboa, codename Rocky, was incorrectly included as a member of GI Joe in the GI Joe Order of Battle issue number two on page ten. Rocky yeah. is not and has not ever been a member of GI Joe. Yeah, that's a kind of a funny story. It's, I wish my buddy Jack uh, would tell that story. Jack Morelli. Um, I literally, I had been, I'd started on that book and I got bounced out of there and he and Howard Mackey were the editor and assistant editor on, who carried forth the, the order of battle. And I don't know who put Rocky Balboa as a character. It probably was Larry, but <laughs> it was Jack who had to, you know, get the type done and truck it through production and get it pasted up and sent up. And I did Jack the disservice of dragging him out of the bullpen and turning him into an assistant editor. When I became an editor, I wanted my 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 best friend, oh, I, you know, my my best compatriot, and my my the guy who was with me in the trenches day and night and forever. And that was Jack by my side. And so the one thing I taught him was, when in doubt, send it out. And so he set that off without really going through legal or having a check. And here's the funny part. He had to make a personal, personal apology to Sylvester Stallone. Oh. On the phone. And that is funny. And you should hear Jack tell the story because he does the voices and everything. And it's very funny. Oh, uh, I wish I could do it. Like, what? Yeah. Uh, hey, Adrian, I, re I really don't appreciate you using my name in the. It's my trademark. You know, I own that name. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to pull this out because. You said you hadn't really read it. You'd heard of it. Whenever I, when I first saw this, I immediately thought of yeah. your work. This yeah. by the, this is stuff by the great Will Eisner for PS Magazine, a military publication. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I thought, I thought everything. genius. You know, wow. the power of comics. Once again, it shows the power of comics. I mean, between this and the illustrated Bibles that are out there, there's two that I know yeah. of. Um, you can tell any story with comics. And do it well. I mean, you could. I know. I I met a GI who reminded me of these things when I was a kid. He said, "I learned how to field strip an M1 thanks to a comic book." Sure. Oh, sure. I didn't know what he was talking about. Now I do. Now I do. Sure. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, wait. I want one more thing before we dive into Punisher. Sure. This is an ER. This is one that I came across. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember. So this is the. Yeah. Now I want to give these these folks the benefit of the doubt, in the sense that yeah. they probably had the right to use all the Marvel artwork, oh, yeah. and they oh, might yeah. not have known that your yeah. name at all, right? But not. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it's true. But they're straight up cribs from e, from ERB. I mean, this straight up like if we learn to look at, I, I think this is. Though. That, that's not after one of mine. They, they, they may. Yeah, no, but okay. Well, wait a minute. Okay. There you so, go. Okay. What else do we, what else do we need to look at here? No, that's definitely. Yeah. 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 Well, no, no, no. And this is, you know, Including right down, right down to the memory wire, which they call multiple heavy weapons on flex control arms. They don't quite understand what I was doing. It, it, it's backwards. It reaches out from the yeah from the coily things backwards, not forwards. But that's okay. God bless them. I, you know, I'm only a phone call away. But that's a, that. Never know mind. That. That's all right. These but guys, what I'm saying is clearly this is a hundred percent like they saw the Marvel Handbook. They're like, let's take it and let's yeah. just take that. Yeah. Well, and and that happens to be their right. That's fine. That's fine. Literally. I I, I mean I have no claim on it at this point. And I, um, okay. Okay, but wait a sec. But wait a second. Yeah. Okay. Now that's not the same angle. Somebody had to redraw it, and they really did their homework. Okay. Little suspension there. 
true. Yeah, they didn't put any um, character to it, like you know, I, I did because you know, I I have. Well, let's see. Yeah, let's see. Let's let's. Okay, never mind. I'm sorry. I take it. Off. <laughs> I take come it. on, come on, Elliot. They no, ripped no. you off, and they had to know. They had to know it was you to rip you off with this one. So I caught him red-handed. Well, this one isn't isn't theirs, but that's okay. But you know what? The concept is that is what's important here. I don't own the Spider Mobile. No, I get it. But would it have hurt to have an after ERB? Would it hurt to have a introduction? Would it ha hurt to like talk about your legacy as a guy who who brought this to life? Sure. No. Of course. No. I. You know. And that twenty bucks gets you a nice hot dog somewhere. You know. Come on. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. I well, mean, Elliot, we're not happy. You know, a lot of people watch the show. A lot of like publishers of comics and i'm not happy until there is going to be like the epic work of elliot r brown like appreciation compilation something uh, i've only done i've only done i mean there's 10 punisher armors actually i can't wait for them to put that together that, i don't know where my omnibus of that is but oh. okay. um, i did the armory uh, the man the iron manual i did the order of battle um i think uh, that's about it I don't think I which i've that. got here yeah. all so i've have the complete works yeah and not to mention though all the handbook stuff not to mention the the dc stuff the wild storm stuff the, the other stuff elliot um my my learned colleague peter sanderson uh, one of the great scholars of comics uh one of the great minds of comics uh he once he said i asked him you know this is early on in my career when, I'm, when he and i were still young and I said, what's the difference between DC and Marvel? And really, you know, it's, and I was going to answer him because I thought it was a rhetorical question. He says, no, no, it's like this. Um, uh, it's uh, Superman wants to push the earth out of its orbit. He does a handstand and then he starts pushing. And you'd say he would go right through the dirt, right through the ground, whatever was there. And he'd just go straight to the center of the earth. No, no, no. DC sprinkles a little fairy dust under his hands and poof, the world comes out of its orbit. Marvel has toilets. And doors and windows that function, and that was Peter. Um, if you if you ever if you know the uh, the uh, English uh, uh, critic, uh, uh, now I'm gonna I just forgot his name. Alistair Cook. That's the guy. Alistair Cook. Peter sounds exactly like Alistair Cook. So if you ever see Alistair Cook, you are listening to Peter Sanders in this case. Okay, so how do we get? Okay. How, I don't know what's more amazing. That number one of this came out, or that number ten of this came out. You know what I'm saying, Elliot? So I, yeah, you got it. You got it right both ways. Um, I was. Uh, I don't know how Don Daly, who apparently really can charm the birds from the trees, must have taken up this thick clutch of, of pages I had done, and brought it into the office. I got all this. We can print a book. And I don't know why anybody said yes. It must have been Punisher Fever. That's all I can tell you. Now, now these are pages that you did what as a backup feature for Punisher War Journal or something. A lot of them, like the one on the right there, is the uh, yeah, that is the very first Punisher page um, that I did, and that's when. Okay, so I'll tell you a story. So I go into Don's office. I mean, okay, I'm working. Interesting at, because it's so different. No captions. It's very different than the others. Um, and here's why. Uh, I'm working at at, at Peter Wallach, and what I didn't know is that they followed a weird industry habit of shutting down their production facilities between Christmas and New Year's. Not just, you know, it's not a holiday. You're not paid. You're essentially laid off for two weeks around that time. I said, oh, oh great. What am I supposed to do? So I did, I reverted to, my, you know, my rest state was going into the office. So I went into the office. I'm sitting down with Don. I'm sitting down with Mark and, you know, all the guys, my buddies, I'm yakking. And Don says, hey, hey, uh, quick question. That's Don. Don Bill. Quick question. Uh, uh, you got uh, you got time to do a tech page for guns? I said, yeah, sure. I, sure I do. Because I had nothing staring at me for two weeks. <clears throat> so he hands me um, a piece of reference that Carl Potts had dug up of, and it was this thing. It's the Gantz or the or the Gonk or something like that. Machine pistol. <clears throat> and the only time it's it's most prominently featured is in. Um, I just was talking about it. 
uh, 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 Total Recall. Total Recall. The bad guy, uh, Mike Ironsides, firing that indiscriminately up, trying to get Arnold. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the gun. But okay, so Don says, Don says. What, this one? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. And he says, um, I got to, I got to, I got to, it's for the Punisher War Journal. And I say, War Journal. See, the trouble is, the trouble with dropping into an office and just sitting down on the couch and, you know, not asking any questions, just having a good time, is that you don't understand what they're doing. The War Journal was a complete spinoff title. Well, I didn't know from spinoffs. This was, you know, we didn't do spinoffs back in the day. We did sequels or we did, you know, a limited series. We didn't do spinoffs. So this was a spinoff. But I didn't know that. The journal. I thought it was a journal. So if you look on that page, you will see oh. a, a bunch of notes that do all the talking. And I think, I think, hey, this is great. You know, this is fine. And then you'll notice that, you know, the draw is open and there's folders full of other stuff. So I figured the Punisher is, you know, he's a, he's a motivated guy. He's got to know his weapons. He's got to, you know, got to keep track of stuff. You'll see there's test shots. Um, he's testing different loads uh, if we're, uh, against the target background. He's got some notes to himself. He's got a nice little drink. He, you know, he's, he's got to stay hydrated. He's a Punisher. So I thought, this is great. That's a lot of fun. Now, okay, that's uh, whatever it was, 175 bucks, and I'm out of there. And then da 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 so I go in the next couple of days, and um, Don says, oh, hey, uh, I really love that page. Can you give me another one? Can you, can you give me two? And so I said, sure. <laughs> in the meantime, so I did two. I can't remember which those are. Um, in the meantime, I go back to work at Wallach's. Um, all hell has broken loose. So Star Trek V has, has gone mad, and uh, they had to pull the stuff away, and they had to leave, and one of the guys is, decides to quit. And, and it's a big mess at, at Peter Wallach. So I, I, I'm in the middle of this weird crossfire. I decide to quit. So I, I quit. And I go into, I go into to the office. I bring the two pages I had done, two more pages. And so it's like it was another month later or something like that. So now we're talking 89, March, April, a March, February, March, something like that. In 89, I bring in the pages. And, oh, these are great. Uh, how about a couple more? Two is what he meant. I brought in seven because I said, "Oh Jesus, there's no money. I gotta do it. I gotta do it." <laughs> so I cranked out as, as best I could. I got some gun magazines. I got some. I got a gun book. I started looking up stuff. And and Don says, oh, "Okay, okay." Now Don's a cool dude. He, he's hard to. It's hard to get him angry. It's hard to get him rattled. I handed him all the pages. And said, <laughs> okay, okay. You went a little crazy. Don't bring any more pages in. I'll go see what I can do. And that's when he came back, you know, like two weeks later, he says, the book is a go. So that's when the Punisher Armory came into existence. And that's that's the true story of the Punisher Armory. And of the so first Tell me, tell tell me what are the orders like on number one? A uh, number one's always gonna sell better than anything else. It's a new Punisher number one at a time when Punisher is hot, obviously. So they're you know what? It wasn't as big as I thought. This was a straight a direct market book at the time and in 89 no was that right in 90 it came out in 90 pretty sure and uh something was going on i can't some other business oriented thing was happening i don't remember i'm I, you know i wish i remembered better um i think it sold 115,000 no 156,000 that's that's the number bubbling up so I made. I would I, love those numbers today, Elliot. They would kill for those kind of numbers. Please, I understand. I understand. Um, even at the end, when it was selling fifty, it would still be a runaway hit today. I know. I know. Um, if if the market were the same, remember, this is when, this was the point in time when, um, uh, Heroes World was was being taken over by Ivan Snyder. Yes, of and, course. Uh, they got rid of all of the kids who knew how to run the computers and they were going to build up their own system uh they didn't build the system first and then start the new talk and that's fine so a lot of the books the the more the more books i did the, the worse it sold is the real thing i one year i think i did four books um in a row you know one after the other of course and it was brought out and it didn't sell very well at all and i, I have no idea why you know that's mike hobson said that and i think that was fine but i didn't understand it 
Um, well, I know. I'll tell you why. Yeah. Uh, nobody gets killed. Nobody gets killed in this book. That's true. The Punisher's the Punisher is never in it. In he's never seen. Yep. You might see the even the skull logo once or twice. That's right. I never liked it. Never liked it. And and it's not just guns because if it had just been guns, I, well, Danny would have been bored if it was just description after description of like this model of Glock and this model of whatever. But it was, and then even you got into like experimental but real weapons. This is one of my all time favorites. Yeah. The, oh no, the PN ninety is still around. It's still out there. It's a FNAL's uh, best selling weapon with the uh, clear plastic cartridge. It's a bullpup design. Take a look where the magazine is on the weapon. It's above yeah. the barrel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the climb. It's really a great little gadget. And and then you get into like scenario training. So this is somebody. That's real. No, that was real. I didn't have to make that. No, that's what I mean. That's what I'm saying is that you took it because like for somebody to do what the Punisher does, he would have to train like a law enforcement, op but beyond what a military law enforcement officer, spy, yeah. so many disciplines he had to bring in. And, and you really when thought I, about that. I, I, I resort to the Monty Python routine where I, where I took a, a dog life and crossed it out and wrote cat in on crayon. Whenever I could, I could get rid of gun and write, a secret agent or EMP or lockpick. Yeah. You know, I, I actually learned how to lockpick for this. I made one of those setups myself. And I'm well, can I say I was inspired to learn how to lockpick because of this? Yeah, yeah. I'm and like, I, and I, I, there you go. I, yeah. Nice. Um, I, I, this stuff was like, because the Punisher, again, this is, it's one of those things. I don't know if you ever saw a movie David Mamet wrote with Anthony Hopkins. And I think it was called, I forgot what it was called, The Bear or The River. I forget it, what it was, but. River. Oh, yeah, I think, oh, I saw that. A tearjerker. Anthony Hopkins has a, has a line where he says, what man, one man can do, another man can do. That's right. Yep. I'd like to give a shout out to the lockpicking lawyer right here on YouTube. Oh, I love that channel. I have a great channel. I love that guy. He is he's got several. Lock Sports. Yep. It's it's insane. It's insane. I love it. Okay. I mean, we could talk about locks all day, but we're not gonna. We're gonna I'm gonna keep going through this punishment. I'm just gonna keep going. I shot that and looking. Yeah. This was a big this was a stretch, but you know, you need something splashy. I made that thing up on the right, and I I shot that street sweeper on the left. Wow. Wind up street sweeper, amazing, beautiful. Show, this is this stuff was great. The like a modular cityscape inside a warehouse. This is where I loved it because you're like the Punisher. Now he's taking down larger and larger criminals. He's taking down cartels. He's got millions of dollars in cash and nothing to spend it on except training. Absolutely, that was that's in, in fact the key to. And now one of the things I point out to anybody ever just hey, you know about guns. Well, what gun should I get? Well, sad. Listen, here's what you got to do before you even think about getting a gun. You should go to a club and you should let them give you a little party and should hand you some weapons and you should train and you should be experienced with what's involved because it's not just going in, picking up a gun, and starting to shoot at a target. New, 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 new. That's the big, that's the end of it. At the very beginning, you have to be taught when and where. When and, and here where. we got the famous spread. The whole, that was the famous spread. spread. Yeah. I don't remember where the first one was, was printed, but uh, the, I mean, you know, where this was printed from, but uh, first, but this is where it was reprinted in the army. You know, what I think it's funny about the Punisher that, you know, as far as being the most realistic um, superhero or whatever you want to say in the Marvel universe, mm -hmm. he's still yet to be captured definitively on, on film. I think, uh, you know what? There was one scene. Uh, I can't remember the actor's name. I love this guy. He's a little, Less imposing than I assumed from Frank Castle's character in the book, but the guy yeah. on the Punisher show, uh, the Punisher TV show, that's you know the that's Daredevil, the Daredevil spinoff show. That's the closest I think they ever got. He did one thing at the end, which really rang true. So he's he's facing, he's got one gun, and he's facing six guys or something like that. They're all armed, and the lead guy says, huh, "What are you going to do? Huh, we're just." We're all standing here. What do you? There's six of us. There's only one of you. And he goes, bam, 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 shoots them all in the head as fast as he can pull the trigger. And you know something? 
Oh, the follow-up of that, of my shooting with my, 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 my comrade, uh, Drew Palmerton, who was a speed shooter and an action shooter. That's that scenario building that I built, that I, that I suggested. That's what, that's what these guys do on the weekends. They build these little, yeah, right. little alleys, the whole alleys, and they can run through it shooting it. At the end, I had the, the third para ordinance modified Colt 45 had a two pound trigger. Wow. You have not lived with terror. Now, I'm shooting this at the end of a dozen guns. He, he took me through um, the, uh, wheel guns up to a two inch barrel, which is like shooting a rocket. It, it, it could knock your eye out without even trying. And I, my, my hand is tired. I'm a big guy, but those that's a lot of shooting. These were 44 magnets. He had a 44 seven inch, uh, eight inch barrel, a 44 um, uh, six inch barrel, a, a 44 five inch barrel, and a, and a 44 two inch barrel. And each one of them was worse than the other. And then he hands me the 45. Bang. At the end of that time, I couldn't tell where my finger was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what was interesting. I, I take a shot. I, I reacquired the target before I do it. Gun went off. That's where I said, you know, I think it's time to slow down. Yeah, yeah. Interesting stuff. Also, my hands are too big. I, I would always uh, pop the magazine out every time. Pain in the neck. Ever fire a 50 cal or... Desert Eagle or anything like that? No, no, no. The 44 is big enough. Even, I wouldn't even try. I hear that's like, that'll, you could break your wrist if you're not. No, no, no. You know, you know what? You know, it. it you got to know when to clinch. You just got to know when to clinch. You, um, oh, I see. The Desert Eagle has muzzle brakes on it that controls a lot of the recoil. And oh. also, you know, half the time when you're looking at a Desert Eagle, you're looking at the 22 version, not the, not the 50. Or the you know the action express load. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. So I mean, it's, here's it's, from the cover. This is a image I chose for the thumbnail. I chose it from your site only because it's one of the rare occasions when we got to see a Punisher logo, and that was just one of the. It's the book is subtle for a book that's all about a character as unsubtle as the Punisher. This book is written and designed with a lot of care and subtlety and a lot of thought. I'm going to just straight up say it more than anything I've ever seen written about the Punisher. Huh. Now, not, not I'm not saying this is my favorite Punisher story or anything. Although I, I will say I've reread these probably more than I've reread any Punisher okay. comics in my life. Well, I, I, it, my, my stuff is a cheat because I tell the story. I, I have the barest sketch of a story. Yeah, and that's it. And I don't need to tell anymore. I don't need to show action. I don't need to show uh, consequence. Although I got to admit, um, there's a couple of times when I had uh, uh, pages that had trails of blood that uh, that was sir printed in blood that told the story, and that's when I I had more fun than usual. Got to admit. Yeah. Yes. Well. There was I'm gonna say it's yeah. It's that what's unspoken around the edges of some of these things, especially in some of them where it's aftermath pictures or whatever like some of the ones that we saw yeah. it is evocative and it does tell a story just it lets you and that's the magic of comics in a nutshell too exactly. now wait a minute let's talk some have said these are not comics um, i've I'm heard you say i've heard you say they're not comics so i don't think they're comics they are in a comic format but they are they're too informative uh john Byrne paid me the ultimate praise he said, I keep these next to my desk because when I need a weapon, you've already drawn it. And that that spoke to me as a and not just as a comic professional, but as a fan of John's work, you know, because yeah. seeing him grind out page after page. If I could save a guy like that a minute's worth of thought, then I'm that makes me glad. And I worked hard to make every one of these proportionally accurate, technically accurate. And I only screwed up a couple of details, technical details on some of the guns. And I'm still ashamed to this day. Like literally two times, I mistook uh, 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 a name for a for a uh, for a dimension, and that was bad. That was well, bad. Elliot, I don't want to. I don't want to tell you. I mean, I respect you. I don't want to tell you you're wrong. Let me interrupt you. That page on the right, sixty fourth page, sixty fourth Punisher page. I did because the, the, the I, I numbered the pages at one point. In, in, at home and i go into don's office and i'm looking at him and i said don i i can't i, I don't think i can do anything I, I i there's no more guns there, there's no more 
the Punisher needs machine guns. There's only like 20 machine guns you're going to run into. You right. know, you can't use art, a military ordinance all the time. You know, you, they just wasn't so much back then in, 90, in the 90s. And I said, you know, he's, he's, uh, there's only so many handguns he's going to use. They got to be big bore. They've got to be uh, semi-automatic. Come on, come on. He doesn't use wheel guns. He's using. Don looks at me and he gives me that. You know, Don. Don is like a hypnotist. I want to see him work on. It. All right, I guess I shouldn't say that. He's a happily married man. He's a happy, happily divorced man with a beautiful daughter. And anyway, so he 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 he, he looks at me with those blue eyes, those, those blinding blue eyes. Elliot, I know you can do this. You're going to keep doing. It. 10 pages, 20, whoops, 10, <laughs> 10 answers, blue. 10 pages, 20 pages, doesn't matter. I said, oh, okay, okay, Don, you're right. I, okay, that's fine. So I go home and I and I go to sleep and I'm troubled and I can't think straight. And I wake up and I make a I make an English muffin and I have, and the wife says, I got some Schmucker strawberry. Can you make me a muffin? Breakfast with the Punisher. Yeah. Hey, there we go. And that's what I did. That turned it, that turned it all around. Didn't matter what was I, it, going on. Yeah. Anyway, and I'll going. agree because it's a point because you don't think about it. Not only, I mean, sure, you go, yeah, the Punisher eats breakfast, but I'm assuming he wakes up and grabs an MRE off the shelf, and eat, wolfs it down or whatever, but he's a person. Whatever. Yes, exactly. And this, I, I can't remember the story. This may have been in some, some victim's home or somebody's home or a bad guy's home or something like that. And he's, you know, he's just done whatever he's done and he's going to take a moment to have a little breakfast. I, you know, it just seems, hey, listen, guys got to eat, you know? I loved it. I love them, the mundanity, the, if that's a word, of just the. I made up my drone. <laughs> and so here's goes, where we get in. Here's science fiction. Here's the rare bits of, of, of just pure Elliot imagination. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, there, are, there were real drones at that point, and they were as big as freaking helicopter yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and i said oh, this is, you know this is microchip you know he's he's talented he's gonna make everything himself if need be and he, it's some of this stuff is off the shelf it's not impossible to make and i, I figured it out i put it together and that was pretty close oh, speaking of microchip that's one of the few characters that you you go into his perspective as yeah. well occasionally i felt i had to because you know frank frank is not the techie guy frank's Frank's good at what he does, but not, you know, stepping outside of his comfort zone. If you take a look at that picture of the guy, the kid stepping out of the helicopter, that's Mike yeah. Rockwitz. Mike Rockwitz. That's, you know, that's when that's when he was an editor at Marvel and we were yakking up a storm one day. I said, you know, I can, I got, have I got Mike Rockwitz in my pen? And I, I just did. I just barely did. American, what does it say? American Teenage Club? Yeah. Saigon. Remembering, I think he's using that to remember um, one of his fallen comrades. Yeah. Uh, uh, Larry gave me a, uh, a, a, a an in-country State Department off print of Vietnam. And one of the details I pulled out was that the cops rode on bicycles, and I included that in there. Okay, this one, this, <laughs> this page, if you take a look at that little drawing and it's the inset, that's a little scrappier than usual. I did that in ballpoint in a hospital bed after I after I ripped up my knee and I was recovering and I, I literally had to finish this and get Don came into the hospital and, and picked up this page for me. I was doing it on the on a lap board in my in, in the hospital room. I couldn't leave the bed. I love it. I mean, so this is pure sci-fi, but all these things from drones to these robot, th these are all things that are completely normal, everyday police apparatus. Yep, they really are. Yeah. I did another little guy too. Um, another little robot guy with a gun mounted on it, which is pretty much what the first police robots were. They were little remote controlled tanks that had a gun on it, had a pistol so they could shoot at uh, um, uh, suspected uh, explosives in a, in, a, in a drug cartel safe house. So you got into small weapons training. You got into martial arts and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yeah. You got into vehicles. You got into weapons. And this is issue to Oh, wait a minute. Okay, but that's the one. So this is this is where I, I I remember reading this, and I think this is the end of issue two. Yeah, this is the end of issue two. Yeah. And this is where it sort of took me by surprise a little bit, and I go, okay. Well, you tell me, Elliot, what's going on here? Oh, it's hard to talk about this. Uh. 
I found this uh, when we were, uh, okay, the wife and I, the wife was pregnant with our son and we had driven across country to go to that. I mentioned there in the, in the preview and in the, in the backstage um, that I had gone to a special weapons and tactics uh, show. Um, but on the way, we drove across the country, drove back two weeks, as much of a vacation as we were going to get. And uh, we would stop at little little places. And they had this really crappy cap gun for sale for like $1.70. I said, hey, this is great. Ah, ha, ha. We'll put this in, in the Punisher armory. Ah, ha, ha. And then I realized, oh, yes. That's exactly, exactly where it goes. In the Punisher armory. For yeah. the so. <laughs> well, we got it. Well, we got it. Let me see. I can't. I got a little closer. Right we make fun of it around here, but it still it still has the power. I, when I showed this to I mean, to Bob Harris, um, he got a little weepy, and I got a little weepy because you know. Well, I'm going to read this if you don't mind. It says this gun isn't a very good gun. This gun shows no known caliber, barely has sights, and doesn't even shoot what it does shoot very well. It's no wonder nine. Accepts no scope of any kind, has no accessories for that matter, unless you count the ratty vinyl-like holster that came with it. Certainly isn't gunmetal tough. I could probably shatter it with my bare hands. I most It most likely would rust if I let it, but I don't because it's my most important gun. And when it saw its heaviest duty, it was the best gun there was. It would slide from that low-slung holster like a natural thought. It fired 50 well-placed rounds squarely into the bad guys, whether they were gangsters or Indians or just young buddies, up the block. This was my little boy's gun. Now I hold on to it and now and then use it. Okay, so now and then he uses it maybe to, you know, I doubt he's taking it out and firing it, right? But maybe it maybe it helps fuel his own, like, fight. Yeah, no, that was... Um... I realized that deep down I'm a big mush. <laughs> I uh, I realized that that um, you know who knows who knows what would happen. You have a you have a kid. You know who knows what would happen if your kid uh, was taken from you, and certainly in an unfair way. And uh, it's hard to know what what a rational man would do. Break, I think, and. Uh, considering his his training, he broke in a certain Frank Castle broke in a certain way, and that's uh, that's that's my little insight into what uh, it's uh, in his head uh, half the time. I, I thought it was cool. I thought it was poignant. I thought it was something that I don't know if I've ever seen in a Punisher comic before, like reference that thing. Yeah, um, but I think it could be. It should maybe should be. Um, um, I think the TV show, the recent one, where he was. Um, Watching out for that kid, the girl kid. I think that was about as close as it came, and that was very touching. Uh, touching stuff. So, like I said before, Elliot, this is it's it's amazing. Okay, so you got to one book, and you and you got a Jim Lee cover on that first on that first yeah, book. Well, right? He was hanging around the office back then. He, you know, he wasn't a giant monster superstar. Literally, while I talk- came out, he just uh, he turned into a monster. He turned into a giant uh, uh, guy. And I gave him hold on. about that gun because yeah, it's a real gun. But it, that's a that's a clip on for uh for, a, for it's a, that's an M two hundred three forty millimeter shell launcher that you put on the underside like, of the gun. It's not. It's a, like a grenade launcher, right? It's like yeah. But I wouldn't want to shoot that thing. I mean, geez, man. Well, that's what's a little bit hilarious to me is it. It's a little bit the difference. It just highlights almost ironically the difference between like. Somebody who's an artist drawn Punisher, who's like their foremost thought is whatever it is, but it's not the accuracy of the weaponry. Yeah. Um, but that's what this book is all about. The guy who rose to the occasion is Michael Golden. He did the last two covers. Oh, of and course. They're, they're, they're phenomenon, phenomenal all among them. Oh, I, yeah, I think I realized that actually. And so, okay, wait a minute. So you worked with Michael Golden in the I wish, heyday, I, I wish I could. I mean, I mean, I know Michael, and you know, he's a, he's one of these. He's one of these. I think I mentioned this in the, our first show. His stuff, his stuff, is a little off-putting at first until you realize it's all there. It's all it's genius. All the action, all the movement, all the acting, the storytelling, and then suddenly 
you're not looking at some strange pr- pr- proportions and you're not looking at a at a funny angle anymore and it's gorgeous and, it, and it's meaningful indeed. and that's why i mean i was so happy to get him on the cover um it's overwhelming uh really you you nailed it he walks the line between the realism and the cartooniness in such a way that it doesn't matter that it's realistic it it, it all works yeah. right on on the page. If you take a look, you, you'll zoom in on any square inch of the weapons. He had been yeah. given all 32 pages oh, of the book oh, at yeah. that point. And he turned the screw heads into little works of art, perfectly realizing those arcs. Okay. That's- I'm just going to say, million dollar Michael Golden. This is a million dollar moment for Michael Golden. Go. Like, yes, true. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's the creator of two of my all time favorite single issues of all time uh, Giant Size Avengers number 10. Okay. And yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, Batman and Batman special number one from 1982. If you've ever read that one, I did. Oh yeah, I did. I, did. I love that one. Yep. Masterpieces, in my opinion. Let me let me tell you let me tell you why the covers look that funny. Yeah. Um, the back covers are just you know scotch tape Xerox. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So the first book, the contents page, the contents page had all the weapons listed and all the manufacturers oh and, yeah that's right I and, that. and and so we said no not anymore and so we sent it up to to legal and barry Kaplan oh. comes, and he says barry good old barry he comes down and he says no no stephen fox stephen fox i'm sorry yeah and he says we, we can't put the real these are real guns you can't put the real manufacturers we'll be sued every one of them will sue us and so he took it out. There's no contents page anymore. And then the guy, so Don, once again. But you Don, use the real manufacturer names throughout, though. I guess that's what I was thinking. It, I, look, am I a lawyer? I, I could just <laughs> put it on TV. So Don, you look like one. Okay. We'll put the names on the cover. <laughs> Goes to the typesetting department. Could you, and this was Brenda Mings at that point. I think it was Brenda. He said, could you put all the names in a strip and set them? to within an inch on either side of the cover for me? And she goes, yes, sir. And all the names of the manufacturers. Oh, are- yeah. It is so funny. And they never saw it. They- <laughs> now that's fun. All right, I love it. Easier to ask forgiveness than to ask permission, right, Elliot? Probably so, yes. So that that's still, and Dougie Braithwaite, I think I think that's, who is that? One of, Doug, Doug Braithwaite is one of these. Yeah, I think he did that one is an incredibly talented British guy. And he came over and I was so happy he threw in uh, a Dougie couple- Braithwaite, Dougie yeah. Braithwaite. I've never heard of Dougie Braithwaite. Doug Braithwaite, just, he did a lot of work back then. He did a couple of books. I think he did more um, uh, illustration for the magazines than he did for the, uh, on this one. That's a real one. Oh, yeah. for the Punisher, ma- for the Punisher magazine? Like, um, the I vol- he did some Punisher stuff too. Not much. I'm, I'd love to know what he's doing these days. He was a very nice guy. I liked him a lot. Yeah, you got into some weird stuff, Elliot, and we're barely into uh, on, on issue six by now, and you're getting into some really cool bomb retrieval stuff. I, mean, it, uh, it, I was so happy when I could find something that wasn't a gun, and even an unusual gun like that sawed off shotgun. Well, with the flechette rounds, I love them. I love that stuff. I'm not going to make your day there. And I can't tell you how happy I was when I learned exactly how a flamethrower works. I found the yeah. uh, manual for it. It's astonishing. In the front of that cone, there are seven matches. And that's uh-huh. hard. They're matches. And you yeah. have to strike them to and leave them lit. I, ah, it's just amazing. That's cool. Yeah. You got to get, get one of those Elon Musk flamethrowers. <laughs> I get you one of those. You know what? God bless you, Elon. I think now I love this. You need to go to space. Yes. Like so, Punisher gets in fights. He gets in fights in crazy situations. He's got to be training far beyond anything that anybody else is going to prepare for. He's he's training on Teflon sheets here. Telling you, yep, yep. Because a ninja, I was reading. Well, uh, among the many uh, how to fight books I read, um, ninjas train on ice. And I figured this is the the closest we're going to get to ice in Midtown Manhattan, you know, any anytime soon. 
Pretty cool. This is my favorite. The, like I said, some of my favorite stuff is like, oh, what's Punisher's favorite walking around gun? Like oh. sometimes you'd have stuff like that. Yep. I'm trying to tell a story. I'm trying to I'm trying to flesh the guy out as a, a little bit because, you know, we see him in the books. It, OK, when I was reading The Punisher, I gave up reading The Punisher because right. I'm, I'm not sure if it was the writer speaking that language and doing a bad job of it. Or if it was the, the, the kind of uh, uh, the, the pacing of the speech, I'm just not sure. Yeah. It was yeah. uh, there was something about it that turned me completely off. And I realized this guy doing what he did. Okay, I've always been a slave to what's in print. Not so much the words, but the pictures. Because the pictures means the artist has interpreted what the writer thought. To you, that's canon. That's canon. Because there it is. It's as real as right there. In the yeah. And... I mean, if you could stick your hands in the page, that's what you would see and feel. So, um, there's one of the there's one of the things I do, which is a bag of guns. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Where there's a random bunch of street guns thrown in, they're all loaded, and the Punisher just sort of reaches in, you know, fumbles it with it for a second to make sure he, you know, has it pointed away from him, and he just starts shooting because you've got to be familiar with whatever's handy. How do you think you pick up a gun and just start shooting? I'm not sure I could. I once held a I once held a, um, a Beretta 92F. I couldn't decock it. Oh, right. Yeah. No. Right. It's not easy. It's not easy. And I don't know. I mean, I didn't want to. It turned out it was loaded, so I had to be more careful than usual. But I couldn't decock it. So I said, "Here you go, buddy." Another yeah. one of those moments of like what Punisher does, like in his downtime, like if he has any physical downtime, he's yeah. still training with like home video shot systems and like souped up video games and whatever. Yeah. 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 Some of my, this is, you get into some really weird modular. Yeah. I think uh, I made that up. I think that was a microchip special. I'm pretty sure I made that up, but none of it's impossible. I mean, that's the, that's the trouble. It was, it could all be made even back in the nineties. <clears throat> I love it. I mean, you go into so many things from ammo, like we said, to, you know, flashbangs, ear protection for the Punisher. Like, there's the things that he, he's got to be using. At that SWAT expo, I met all these guys that I had done pages on. All Mr. Clearout, which was, uh, which was um, uh, uh, what was the name of that company? Para Ordnance or something? No, not Para Ordnance. Para something. They made all the flashbangs. And then they uh -huh. are. All the ones that you slide under doors, and all the ones you just you glue to the to the door, uh, you know, with quick setting glue, and you stand back and look. This guy nearly ripped my hand off. I met Ron Barrett. I think the you know the guy who made the Barrett Fifty, America's premier sniper rifle. I mean, you get into stuff here about like how he put together this this Sears and Robot fun house. You get into just like how he would build his own training facility. This is what I love, Elliot. Keep them sharp. Gotta, gotta keep them going. Get into batons, tactical batons. Let's go. There you are. It's right. I, I see. I see. I'm telling you. I but I, these are pages I'm less I'm less proud of <laughs> when they're huge blank spaces. <laughs> right. No, I hear you. For every one of these pages on the right, I have a big blank space on the left. I I tried to well, balance. You know, yeah, that's what I was gonna say though. For every issue, there's not a single issue that's just all phoned in. I mean, I'm gonna say. The difference between, say, this and the uh, G.I. Joe Equipment Handbook is, is, is there's a big difference. There's a big difference, yeah. No, that I had to bang out. That, that didn't call for analysis. All, all of the techie stuff. That's my, that's my, on the right is my, my Manhattan apartment tub. Well, and talk about telling a story, man. I'm going to say it, Elliot. You are, these are comics. You are telling a story, but in a different way. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not arguing. I, I, I do. I tried very hard to tell a story. I especially tried to tell a story when the pages were very empty and vacuous. Often, um, I always saw. I tried to make it a balance of something to draw the reader in, even if there was very little on the page. So I guess ah, here's one. Here's one of those storytelling pages. I love that one. I love that one. He's just sitting up there drinking coffee, letting everybody kill each other. Yeah, this is so. Yeah, this was the kind of stuff that just like, you know, makes me as a guy who really loves 
I don't know. I love equipment. I love technology. I don't love guns. I don't, I'm not into guns. I'm not into weapons. I've, I, I, I don't think I could hack it in the military, but man, there's just something about these, the personal, the, 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 the story of the Punisher is very compelling. Now let, let's talk for a second about sure. the Punisher and law enforcement and the kind of controversies that, what do you think about that stuff? What do you think about the Punisher skull being a symbol used by some law enforcement I know. officers? Um, I think the police departments should not. The Punisher is a work of fiction. The Punisher is, in the real world, he'd be a vigilante and hunted. And in the real world, I don't believe he'd be able to get away with what he does. So... So easily. Oh, that's a real that's a real Russian landmine. Yeah, right there. You got both of them. You know, you know that I gotta tell you, the the fuse of a of a of a hand grenade is a pain in the ass to draw, right? Huh. It really is. And those are no, those aren't those aren't American, but they're still a pain in the ass. Um anyway, um, um police Police are representatives to a community. They're not just—they're uh, not just the enforcement of the law, and they have—they they have a bigger burden than just a one-on-one. They're—they're presenting a, a um, an overall uh, uh, public outreach, and the Punisher logo says something completely different. Um, it's above the law. It—it it may be a justice of some kind, but that's not—that's not the way to present justice. And so, I mean, as a, you know, I believe in the Constitution, I believe in the you know, in law and order for real. And although I'm not a Republican, I, I may be, I may sound more like a Republican than most Republicans do. I believe, oh yeah, clear out, Mr. Clear out. I read, I met those guys. They were, they were laughing their heads off that I had done a comic book page. Yeah, it's, yeah, That's it's, hilarious. I really did. That was, I actually, did you ever think about going to the manufacturers and trying to sell them like the original artwork? I'll bet you they would buy them for thousands, Elliot. Oh, I no, I no, I I no. Those guys, all those guys are out of business. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually got in touch. Uh, the guy who did the climbing wall page somewhere in there. Oh yeah, that's another one of my my tear jerkers talking about a, a dog who hates them. I love that. Huh. Um, and the Vietnam wall page, that's another, that, that, yes, I don't think we've gotten there yet. Maybe I don't think so either. I have a hard time looking at that. We'll keep going. We'll keep, we're going to just keep going because you know, one thing that's interesting about this in this day and age, Elliot, when everything has been reprinted and I mean, yeah, they are scraping, they're scraping I, the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, I know. I've seen, I've seen, believe me, I'm waiting for this to come out. I, I, I need a good payday. That'd be great. I, I mean, Elliot, we can get you spit your spitfire and the troubleshooters issues that you did. Those are available in trade paperback, okay? You're kidding. They are? I know they are. They've collected that new universe stuff. I'm sure they are. By the way, for you fans out there, Todd McFarlane's first published Marvel work was for Elliot R. Brown's Spitfire and the Troubleshooters. Holy mama. Okay, well, I, now I have to go look because, all right, let's talk Spitfire. Yeah. New universe. I'm um, I'm in there. That's all. Jim Shooter's love child, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. Now I now okay. Information has come to light some thirty years later that changes my my, my bitterness and unhappiness with the situation. Oh yeah. The the uh the blind, the blind page. I um I actually didn't know if Gallaudet University was still in business, so I called him up. Those were the days, you know, there was no internet back then. So I, if you needed to find out if somebody was still there, you had to call them on the phone. Um, so. Shooter wants to start learning sign language. Yeah. Shooter wants to start. Uh, he, 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 he's been motivated by the idea that Stanley put his name on everything. And he shouldn't have had everything. So he wanted something new that reflected a non, ah. you know, a non-stand thing, a whole, you know, clearly non-stand. Not necessarily shooter presents, but along those lines. 
So the Some market with less legacy baggage, maybe. Yes, uh-huh. legacy baggage. Yes, all new. Well, you know, we've learned a lot in 30 years, 40 years. We should be able to do something with it. Um, so here's what was funny. So we go to the we go to this giant now. Talk about me being not, I, you know, for all the pictures I took, I sure didn't take a bunch of pictures. I really should have. I should have taken pictures of this meeting. We were at the Hotel Roosevelt. No, not the Roosevelt Hotel. The Hotel Roosevelt. Not too far from Marvel of downtown on 34th Street. Which Marvel's offices were on 28th. Maybe this was on 34th, 35th Street. It was a beautiful, rest, a beautiful hotel. We were in the conference room. And Shooter's holding up a check. And he says, I got a check for $125,000 here. We're going we're gonna to develop a brand new title. We're going to do all, all new. All new. And this is very exciting. Okay, this is great. Sometime later, he calls me and Jack in. Uh, he calls me in, and you know, I want to. I, I, who, who do you want to be an assistant editor? I said, Jack. We go into his office. He says, okay, I'm going to make you guys an editorial team. Not really, but I'm going to do it. So immediately, you're going to get raises. And I went up to you know, twenty six thousand dollars, which was astonishing, uh, from eighteen, which was you know, I was just I was counting my pennies and eating uh, ramen noodles. Um, okay. And uh, so that was a that was a great six months of earning extra money. And um, we have a big meeting. So there was uh, Tom DeFalco, uh, uh, Archie, Archie Goodwin, the late great. Uh, who else was in there? Mark Grunewald, uh, me and Jack, uh, Bob Budiansky, and and Shooter. And I'm looking around and I'm thinking, okay, this is the new universe. The only thing that's new here is me and Jack. And we were a little too green, is the nicest way I can put it. I think we were a little too green. We also came along at a politically... Is that the one where I give the Fackler uh, ballistic gelatin? Yeah, I thought that was... Yes. More, more cooking with the Punisher. That's the real formula. Although, because now yeah, you... Punish- can- Punisher's <laughs> ballistic gel recipe, folks. Yeah, yeah. You can buy this stuff on the on the internet now. I mean, on the eBay now. Oh, there's the. I there's forget the, which one of these is incredibly hard. I think this is the one that's incredibly rare and hard to find. Really, number ten because the low print run. Ah, number nine. This is the one I don't. I've got. I just happen to have one autographed by one ERB. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Very hard to find, though. This I think it's number nine or number ten. The one of the later ones, the print runs by then were so low, yeah, that it's just there. There's just not many out there. Okay, but the quality did not dip one iota. I was, I, I I'm happy to say, because I was this, unaffected by print runs of any kind. And this book stayed strong, man. This was one that I looked forward to. It didn't come out like, like. Even regular, like quarterly, is what you said. Like re- into twice a year, and by annual. Yeah. yeah. And dude, I would look forward to always. I would always make sure that I got that. I think the okay. nine and ten. The only reason I didn't have them is because I was like in college when, like, that's what, right when I moved. Um. Now, a- what I was going to say though is none of this stuff is 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 back in print, and this does deserves to be in print, if only as part of, say, maybe a Punisher omnibus collection or something like that. I happen to agree. 320 pages of pure brown reprint money? You betcha. Yeah. Where does the Punisher work out? Why did Elliot need to draw? I had to put something? it in. Like, had to, had how big of a headache is that to draw in perspective? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Headache is the word. Yeah. I, uh, that's, and once again, I just got the catalog and, and uh, drew from the catalog. And that's great because what is it? It's a drawing of a gym machine, right? Like what is like, wh- how is this a page in a Punisher book by Marvel Comics? This is the, to me, the mind blowing. You've seen the muscles. Come on. Well, those don't, those don't come from uh, eating Wheaties. Come on. This is what I mean. When the Punisher's not killing criminals, he's doing push ups or he's training to kill criminals, right? That's it. That's it in a nutshell. I love it. This was my, so this is it, man. This was my favorite thing. Oh, wait a minute. Let's keep going. Wait, we got one more issue. I want to keep going here because there's, oops, there's some really cool ones here. These are sticking together. My hands are so cold, Elliot. 
Gotta get those um, gloves oh, on my fingers, buddy. More microchip pages. I really like the dip in the microchip. They seem to get a little bit more frequent in the later issues. I um, think maybe you were getting into higher tech stuff. It really was harder to find the appropriate weapon. Um, uh, you know, and uh, it's more than just um, the gun. It's also good pictures of the gun. It's not like I had these yeah. guns around here. Yeah, right. um, those were the, those were different days, my friend. The internet. Oh, there you go. Flag flag uh, protocol. Yeah, I mean, I thought I had one more. There's one more page here sticking together. Yeah, I wanted to. I want to make sure this gets looked at because, like, not a lot of people are going to be able to even find this issue at all. Wow. Okay. Yeah. This is a lost Punisher classic, and I'm going to say if you are call yourself a Punisher fan, not even a completist, but a true just fan of the character, and you haven't read this book, you're seriously missing out. Because I can, can you guys t can you tell that I like this book world? I think that, I, and and can you tell that Elliot had a blast drawing it because nobody works this hard. Without yeah. having fun doing it. Jack's brother, uh, Frank, was a bus mechanic for the city, for MTA. I got permission to go out to one of the maintenance depots and way in the middle of, the, of, of Brooklyn. And there was a bus up on the lift that they let me take pictures of. And when was the last time you saw the other side of a bus? Never, Elliot. I had to show it. I had to show it. Nobody else is going to see this thing. And so there you go. Now you know. And I got to say, like, and nobody, because nobody's seen the other side, but so nobody's going to know if you cheated here, Elliot. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's true. It's true. No, I, that's I the miracle. Know. That's the miracle of Elliot R. Brown, folks. This is why I love this guy. This is why I love his work, because it's that, it's that no, I attempt. Cheated. I cheated on that one. <laughs> it's the attempt to bring realism. It's what did I say? I, that Elliot R. Brown is the bridge between technical drawing and cartooning. I'm going to reiterate that. Okay. Oh, back to Spitfire. Okay, so Spitfire. Spitfire. So for some reason, I think, I'm pretty sure it was Jack who came up with the whole idea of Spitfire and the troubleshooters. He certainly, um, Jack, Jack Morelli, uh, Squid Morelli, Squid because he used to be on the on the boats and in, 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 you know, in fishing boats when he was a kid, a sailor. Um, a genius kid, and he's such a, he's mellowed a lot. You know, he's had a couple of kids. He lives, he lives not too far from here. I mean, it's pretty far if you're walking, but it's not that. Um, I, I still consider him one of my closest friends. But we spent night and day, shoulder to shoulder, slaving away, and then we did sit fire in the public shoes. So, we, um, my whole point was to turn these kids into the superhero support team because the main character was a woman her dad was a weapons designer munitions designer who would come up with a, a, a motorized suit an exoskeleton suit. and uh, the whole point was that he was, he was killed and he didn't give the secrets the secrets of the suit to the to the corporate bad guy and so uh, Jenny, the kid, Jenny Swenson. I don't know if you ever knew the the uh, the franchise of, of uh, Sundays. Uh, Swenson's was an ice cream parlor throughout the yeah, country. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, where yeah. there was one right around the corner from where I lived, and Jack and I would go in there and have uh, ice cream and talk about what the story sh should be. So the kids. Now Jack pointed this out to me, and I'd completely forgotten about this detail. The kids were completely. Um, I keep wiggling this thing. I'm sorry, buddy. Um, the kids are diverse. There's, uh, there's uh, everybody from an Indian kid to a, to a Japanese kid. So we had it all. So if they're looking to make a movie, uh, they can, they've got it all built in. There's the steam and the STEM. It's all in there. You know, it's the, the science teacher at MIT, MIT. Now my, my best, I have two best childhood friends. Uh, one is Paul Turgeon who attended MIT and the other is James Sanders who uh, went to graduate school in MIT. So I was spending a lot of time on MIT campus because I was a bum. I, I had uh, no work or I was at Marvel. And 
So I knew a lot of the ins and outs of the campus and all the secret rooms and the doors that you weren't supposed to go through. And so Jack and I took the train. No, what did we do? There was something, there was a car involved. His grandfather had died. And, uh, you know, yeah, the car died on the way back and we took the train home. Okay, that's right. All right. So we, we, we drove into, into, into Massachusetts. We drove to Boston. I took a whole bunch of film for reference of the MIT campus. Um, the, the sculling rooms, the you know, the, the, all the communal centers, the cafeterias, the quads, walking around the various buildings, the special buildings. Um, couldn't do the stuff I did when I was younger, which is run around on the rooftops. <coughs> but that's other that's other stuff. And um, they got oh, and they have a rich tradition. I learned to pick locks from the MIT Guide to Lock Picking. They have a rich tradition of that in there. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> so um, we were really trying hard. I had the guy of, of, of my dreams as the as the Tetzla Richter, her trip. Um, we were simpatico. We we talked the same language. He was a mad nineteen uh, thirties plane guy. I was right there after. Ah, so we both had real mechanical experience because one of the conceits of Spitfire. I don't know if you. I don't think you mentioned this. We sort of glossed over it. It, it was Iron Man. But with real world technology, it was all like technology that existed at that time. As real as I could make it without, I, now here's the bad part. I didn't get a chance to really design stuff. We were stuck. Um, we, had, we had to start January of 86. And then the, and one of our first plots was there's a shuttle um, problem. Uh -oh. And so it's fire. Uh -oh. The kids take their experimental rocket pack and stick it on the legs. And she goes up and repairs the shuttle from the outside and goes back down. Unfortunately, January 28th was when the shuttle disaster blew up. Oh, yeah. yeah. So much for that plot. So oh. our next plot, our next plot was um, uh, she was going to, there was a, in the news, there was one of those a typical, you know, it seems like every year there's a story of some kid falls down a well. So there was this this uh, heartbreaking story where a little girl had fallen into a well in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, something like that. One of the peace states. And um, so we're going to have Spitfire, you know, get the drill rig out and the, and the spinning front things with the Howard Hughes, the drill bits go straight down, whatever. We, I, we were going to, Jim comes along, Jim Shooter, that would be our boss. Loves the story. Says, uh, I like that so much, I'm going to have that one for me, for Nova. So Nova it, oh, his, no. takes that. So we were high and dry. And uh, and then I was uh, summarily dismissed from the book. Um, <clears throat> but it, it featured the first published artwork from Marvel of a young Todd McFarlane. I did not know that, but good for Todd. Yeah, he... he, he, um, he he hitched his wagon to a, a falling star and crashed into pieces and came up as a brilliant survivor. That's so. what I'm saying. He's yet another ERB coattail writer who took one of your concepts and wrote it to commercial success. In fact, we'll just say it right now. Well, it wasn't commercial success uh, on Spitfire. you got to admit. Um, out of all of the, the New Universe books, I'm uh, DP7. DP Mark Gruenwald's uh, superhero book was... A serious cut above. It's the only one that should have remained in the pantheon of Marvel. I read them all, and that was the best by far. It was the best. I, 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 it was the best. No doubt about it. It was the one that was the most interesting. Uh, <clears throat> had great characters, just good writing and pacing. It was just like it was very. It was just very well executed. Yeah, it was. It was Mark at the height of his powers, and it was, these were all his characters. No editor involved at all. Yeah. You know, undiluted Mark, and they were really interesting characters. Yeah, they um, were cool. I thought Starbrand was pretty cool too. No, Starbrand sucked. Um, <laughs> I was I was the editor of Starbrand, and um, I thought the concept of Starbrand was a very cool idea. Uh yeah, yeah. The concept is now. I'm not sure what happened in the book. <laughs> Ex execution is another story, right? Um, well, it's interesting. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a story I have not shared with anybody. So, okay, it was very hard to get work out of John Jr. And I think John, John Romita Jr. Jr. John Romita Jr. Major talent at that point. You know, tippy top. 
a good friend with Shooter. And I think that's what really was the problem here. Because uh, here you are with Jim Shooter as your as the Uber boss. And here here you, you know, your mom's working there, your dad's working there, everybody's everybody's ready to turn the thumbscrews a little bit tighter. And you've got to produce. So it was very hard to get get a hold of him at one point. His mom got a hold of him and said, You better bring that book in. You better you better bring it in. So one Saturday we met in the office and he comes in. Nobody else there. It was just us. And he shows me the pages. And I and at this point, you know, I'm going, I'm having anxiety attacks like I haven't had since I was a kid moving from Boston. I in my family breakup time. I mean, I was I was having uh, you know pressure dreams. And uh, I see the pages, and I know the I know the script cold. I'm, I'm you know I'm not, I'm not, and I'm looking at it. And I said, John, Shooter says right here on this page that you're supposed to show this, and you're showing something else. He says, Well, I'm tightening it up. Uh, no, 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 no. Jim Shooter wrote down he wanted to see this, not what you want to show. This is no time to start pulling in the you know the Marvel method. No, 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 no. When Jim Shooter says he wants to see a close, uh, the face of the guy, you show the face. You don't right. come picking up the rock. You show. He says, oh, you're right. He goes away and he redoes it. And then he did a great job. I mean, it was really. Well, that's cool to know, though, that he could take direction like that and, 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 and take it for the, for the I, good book. I yelled at him. And I don't. It was the only time I've yelled at any professional. But I, John and I have been, you know, chummy for years. I mean, we felt like we hung out. Right. But we've been on staff. We knew where we were coming from. Uh, uh, and this was the time to yell at somebody. This was one of the most stressful times in my so-called professional life. And after being after being exposed to what Jim was doing with the character, Jim was putting all his marbles in one basket. This was it. This, this, yeah. this was his creative juice to boil down and turned into a syrup and laid on beautifully. And you had better freaking pay attention to what Jim ah. And that's really what I told them. That's, I mean, I, I said, Johnny, this is, you know, first off, it's, it's Jim. It's not like, you know, somebody else. It, it, it's Jim. It's not John Byrne. It's Jim. He's not just, he's not just a writer. He's, you know, this is the one from 13 on. This is the one who's into you know, everything. But then, but then again, right, J.R.J.R. J. R. was not just another, right, like the son of the anointed, the, 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 no, no, no. You see, this is the beauty part. This is the thing that's harder to understand, harder to communicate. From the inside, that wasn't the case at all. You know you know that pyramid in Egypt that's got a pinpoint at the top? Well, right on the top of that pinpoint, that's Jim Shooter. That's Jim Shooter yeah. written up there. Everybody else is down below, down, 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 down. John, yes, is very high, high up. John Sr., John Jr., they're way up there. But they're not at the tippy point. Yeah, there. I get you. I get you. That's... That's that's that story from the inside, and um, John, I, I you know I love the work he's doing on that Superboy thing or Superman, whatever the hell it is. Um, his art has never been better. His storytelling power, I love the uh, I love storytelling. His, he's he's great. He's still, he's still yeah, he's still amazing. Um, the, uh, the 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 hit girl, uh, that's that. Um, all the success for that is deserved. That was a fascinating. Um, investigation that was really something i mean i hope chloe moretz is okay but you know <laughs> it was an amazing uh, uh um effort and, and i i you know take nothing away from john john is still we're, we're we, we, that guys I, what i love about that guy is that he's able to come away from his father's shadow and be somebody who is who is who is in his own right a great cartoonist without aping his dad's styling in any way you're not going to confuse the two but you're going to see storytelling chops for both of them. I don't think it's possible. John Senior, I'm not sure. Draw like that, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Nobody can draw like that. It's there's something weird about John. He, and, um, he literally, he 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 gets all nervous and flustered. He arranges the board on his page. He gets the T square up and he puts one thing down and he puts another thing on top of it. And he puts another pair of glasses. And he just like he picks up a pencil and he puts down a line like a machine and it's yeah perfect and it's every line it's like he doesn't pick up the pencil it's just like handwriting it's amazing amazing I love that was inhuman for a guy like that to come behind a genius like Ditko and to even take Spider Man then to a, that that next level yeah 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 well also well I also remember you know it's funny 
remember that that pointy pyramid thing when when John John would tell me I would bring work in to Stan and Stan would take his big black pencil and scribble stuff out on the board. Lines aren't heavy enough. You take this back, John. So right. there's always you know stuff rolls downhill and um, whatever was going on in John's mind, uh, you're the richer for it. Let's put it that way. And John Jr. too. John yeah, please. of course. Okay, so Al Elliot, um, I want to go to some viewer comments, but you had a couple of things you were going to show me. Do you want to go? Oh yeah. Do you want to go? Okay. Let's see if I can do go this. there. And while you're while you're headed over there, I'm going to pull up some viewer viewer comments here for a second. We'll we'll talk. To you. All right. you can take that thing with you. Yeah, just you can follow you right along. And we've got right. viewer comments. We've had some for the very from the beginning. Oh man, from long time fan. Oh, Subscriber yep. member, Coffee Breath. He, he was here for the first ERB interview, right? <laughs> and he's been there ever since. What's it, let's see. What are we doing? Here, I'll put this right here. Joe Cool says, hey. Joe Cool also says, hey, ROMs, armor, technical blueprints, Hawkeyes, bow and arrows. Yeah. So remember yeah. those blueprints. We all do. They're they're etched in my mind. In fact, I was just showing Elliot earlier, guys. I I make my own. I made my own juggling clubs. Okay, and absolutely. These, Listen. these things have modular head, removable heads, inspired by the Elliot R. Brown Hawkeye arrows, right down to the putty. Where are you gonna find the putty a copy head. of Bus World? I found it. Bus World. What the hell? Ah! The real industry Did you research. Unbelievable. We're taking wait, I want to ISO you here for a second, Elliot. Tell, tell us what we're looking at. What are you what are you digging through right now? This is my this is my, some of my reference from back in the day. I was only as good as my reference photos. And oh yeah, here we go. Here's the one. <laughs> I still don't believe this. Machine gun news. Yes. Machine gun news. What are you? Oh, look at this kid. Look at this kid firing double machine guns right on the cover. And and here, you know, I needed pictures of the of the Mac Ten, the Ingram. I got it. I got it. Good shots. Still That's amazing. Great. And you can see all of the uh, the yellow sticky notes. This is wherever I got an idea. And these guys, you know, these guys were, you know, these are cops and these are private owners. And here's a guy with a minigun. I mean, I had a hard time finding good reference on a minigun because that that um, articulated uh, 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 mm -hmm. uh, bullet guide, cartridge guide, is a pain in the neck to draw. But I found it thanks to a machine. You Predator? Did you be a Predator? That Jesse Ventura fires when it has one in Predator. Yep, that's right. It's an XM one fifty four. Of course, it is. Throwers. I mean, machine gun news. I mean, this this was invaluable. <laughs> Invaluable. That's the sort of thing I'm talking about. So this is pre-internet, you know, guys. You had to have a artists were known for keeping amazing source files of material to do their art from. SWAT magazine. Oops. Uh, Chuck Chuck Rosansky uh, on the show talked about Edgar Church. He was an artist who he bought the um, Mile High collection of comics yeah. after that guy passed. And he had an amazing, he was an artist himself who had an amazing reference library, like unbelievable reference library. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Frank Robinson. For a little while, we had um, a filing cabinet, a four draw filing cabinet floating around the office. That was the Marie Severin says, that's Frank Robinson's reference files. And I'm looking in there and I can't believe my eyes. Astonishing amounts of stuff. Um, I think, uh, just put throwing up some comments from from some of our some of our fans here talking about the Punisher. Really love the show. Yeah. Survival stuff, you know. Perfect. I, I had a year of that. <laughs> yeah, Elliot, you're in. Where are you at, man? You're in your underground lair yourself. That. Uh, my Unterbunker. 
I believe that was used as reference for the movie Silence of the Lambs, if I'm not mistaken. I think they're... It could, it could have been. Um, so I, I went to... So, guy comes in the office, Drew Parmenter, he says, you know, you used, you used my, my client's stuff without approval. So we became close friends. And he says, okay, I know the guy who runs the SWAT Expo in California. I'll get you some tickets. Okay. The wife and I drive across country, go into the convention center, and I just go up and down the aisles taking every bit of, uh, every bit of literature. And I mean every bit of literature. Now, what fun tchotchkes are they giving out there? Do you get like a baton with a corporate logo on it or something? I get away with that stuff. Um, Commemorative taser? Oakley? Yeah, I wish. Are you kidding? And all the guys were special forces. You could always tell the special forces guys, demanding the boots and running the behind the scenes, because they're all sitting around with coiled springs. <laughs> I love those guys. Just waiting, waiting for like a terrorist action. Somebody to try something because they're ready. You know, and this is where I get, you know, all my hard edged information. Uh -huh. systems uh -huh. um, the guy who ran the, uh, the con itself had invented a, uh, a specific type of quick release for the harness and for, for uh, parachute harnesses and had sold it and made his money on, on uh, selling that to the military. Um, you know, tons and tons of stuff you'd never, and I got, I'm talking, I've got four more of these and I would get information. I would get little bits of, of inspiration from all of that. And if that's not crazy enough, so, all right, okay, good. So the Japanese, the Japanese, they're not supposed to have, they're not supposed to have guns. So they make replica guns. Oh. While they're at it, they take pictures of them in such glowing close up. Yeah, right. On and on. If I needed well something. lit. What yeah. is it about the Japanese? Why are they so cool? Why are they so cool? Because you know what? They know what's cool. They just do. And I was I was all at, you know, look at all these knives. I mean, just and beautiful reference. And occasionally there would be real reenactors. I, you know, intense. That's really awesome. And look at this. Look at this. I mean, I can't use guns like this. Be beautiful yeah. guns because it's too it's too pretty for the for the Punisher. Um, however, I can take I can take you know the vented ports and and put them put them on another gun design. Sometimes I did. And I tell you, I got to know guns pretty well. And, you know, I, I, I well that that that's evident. Elliot, yeah, because you're dropping references now. Yeah. I, do you still stay up on this stuff? Are you on like weird mailing lists and you're getting like Christmas cards from it's too expensive weapons? It's just too expensive. It's hard to do that. Yeah. Um, I spent a significant fraction of my income on magazine subscriptions. You know, a couple of hundred bucks a month. That's that's two and a half pages. Wow. So yeah. you know, I had to. All right, let's see. Whoa, what have I got here? Ooh. Okay. Just for research, just to stay up to date, just for doing your thing. Yep. Pretty cool, man. It shows. That kind of research and attention, it's something that... It's nice to hear. It's a little easier to do now, I would think, right? Like, you got the internet. Oh, boy, is it ever. All right, let's see if I can not yank this on the floor. But even though it's easier, doesn't mean anybody's doing it. I don't see anybody putting the, the, <laughs> as much care and detail. To the devil. No, nobody does that anymore. It's easy. actually it's easier to look at my stuff. Those are my those are my handwritten notes. Okay. Awesome. And this is what got turned into that cover that we saw yep. earlier. Yep. On the issue bag. Yeah, that's what I mean. Dusty was amazing. He really spun some gold uh, out of that. Say it again. I said he spun some gold out of that one. Oh yes, he did. Yeah, no, he's gifted man. Gifted man. Oh, speaking of well mined territory, this is another one that's ripped off in 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 the vehicle owner's guide. Oh, this is this is from this is a Gruenwald design, so I can't you know I can't yeah. think of that. 
Um, and it's also from uh, Fireball XL5 because, you know, Grunewald is, you know, a big baby. He couldn't oh. have to redesign something. So he showed me what he had done and said, yeah, you fix it. I go, okay, buddy. <clears throat> so I'm not. Oh, he designed the, he designed the outside, right? I mean, come on. Yeah. Yes, he did. I don't see I don't see Grunewald putting in the exhaust manifolds and whatever else like 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 you went. This is one of my most prized possessions. A blank new universe cover page. Cool. I told them I think you know what? It's better than a lot of the ones that aren't blank. Sorry. <laughs> Have to agree, Dan. <laughs> yeah. And this was uh pen my pencils for a uh I don't know. This was oh yeah, this was a uh, <clears throat> pardon me. I'm getting a little reflect on the dust <laughs> down here. Uh, an assistant editor's month page. Oh yeah, yeah. All done with Xeroxes, all thrown together in 15 minutes. I put a telephone on the Xerox machine, took a picture. And we talked about this a lot in our other interview. I suggest people check it out. But Elliot is also the creator of like basically every single photo cover Marvel ever did on a Marvel comic. I did a lot. I Not all of them. Not all of them by any means. Uh, okay. All the good ones, all the best ones, all the ones that are so really well known and loved, especially that one of okay. Spider Man, of Peter Parker taking off his mask with you in the back as the cameraman. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, I would say that's the ultimate Marvel photo cover. Like, if there could only be one, that is probably the best. Okay, that's I I'll go for that. So, this. Oh, is yeah. turned into one of those prints. This is this was after Mark, uh, Mark Grunewald, who had a real fixation for doing um, maps. He wasn't any good at it, but he was, you know, he wasn't <laughs> making it make any sense. But this was the this was the plan that I turned into that one page that I sent you. That was the the down shot of Asgard. Yes, was, you know, this is everything that was in it. And this was what he, this was one of the things he gave to me, Asgard the Continent. Uh, and so this is, I had to, I had to, I think I redid this one. And this was another, another one. It's, I mean, it really, this is, this is all my, 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 my junky thing. Okay. So here's the problem with some of the reselling stuff. Oh, believe it or not. This is something I did to, uh, I did a, I did a, a Robin. Uh, armored costume. Oh, cool! Thing, and this is the pencils. I inked it on a tracing paper to make it look like a blueprint. And somewhere, and I think they turned it into a. Uh, uh, it was a folded up insert thing for a for a, a bagged comic, a special edition. I can't remember something about Robin. Oh, that looks like the Robin Tim Drake Robin era. Could be. I don't remember. It's been, you know, the DC stuff is very uh, transitory to me. Yeah, this is where I figured it all out and had to try to try to, try to make it work. And you know, and you know, DC, DC doesn't like it. Uh, you know, when you you just oh, here's my other buddy, Rick Bryant. I, I honestly. Elliot, I really think you could have a you could do a whole series of books if you wanted to on fantasy art and sci-fi architecture. Just do it. Just taking famous castles, whatever from liter from story, sci-fi, and what have you, and just putting making doing what you do, doing your own thing. I'd buy that book. I'm not against it, but you know the the worst. Okay, so here's something I learned to my two you know to the world's detriment. Um. So I had done, I had done, uh, very, very lovely uh, guys. They came when when Marvel came out of bankruptcy in 2007. I was very very nice uh, of, uh, of them to give me a call and ask me to do some work. Do some. I did the I did the Atlas. I did a whole bunch of stuff for the Atlas, and uh, they had a, a, a an internet of a variety of internet guys and gals who were very good and very smart, but it turns out they were not as good or as smart as we were back in the Marvel Universe days. Right. When it came to providing me with, with information and a series of photographs, a series of, I'm sorry, comic book panels, they could not do it. 
Um, Genius is like Peter Sanderson, uh, Peter Gillis. Genius is like Mark uh, Grunewald. They would find one panel. Oh. It's all. All I needed. These guys gave me 20, and they were all garbage. They were useless. And so I was sitting there. I'm staring at these at these blank pages and looking at the reference and looking at the blank page, looking at the reference, looking at the blank page for you know for two weeks. I said, okay, got to do something. And I'm not exactly. And and then the guys, uh, who was his name? Uh, Jeff Youngquist, Youngquist, who is a major guy over at Marvel. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not knocking you, Jeff. Really, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just, but um, he was not exactly hands on when it came to. <laughs> pardon me. A little, my bald head is letting it slip. Um, not exactly involved, heavily involved in letting me know exactly what was needed. Now, I sort of went off and thought my own thoughts, which is a dangerous thing for any freelancer to do. And uh, the, the printed book looks very strange with what I contributed. However, I have never invited anyone to pay close attention to the flags. The flags are a riot. I made up 80 flags or something like that I, maybe oh, it was cool um if you ever see the one for uh who, where does uh kazar come from gone wanda forgotten uh, you know, the, um forgotten something or other yeah that's you know what what is it the kazar is from the the, the hidden light God, the, oh, man, yeah, how exactly. i forget that yeah. uh, some kind of bar downtown yeah and uh <laughs> I made up. I made up a savage land. Savage land. Yeah, that's right. The savage land. So the flag for the savage land is one of my personal favorites. It's a riot. It's okay. got uh, scratch marks on it and teeth marks on it. <laughs> of course. Of you know, because what else? Because he's the king. He said, "Here's what you got to do." Anyway, I, I, you know, you, you, you're working on these things until three in the morning. You get a little daffy. I think he worked on. It. He got input from Zabu. Maybe, right? Wasn't that the... Yeah, exactly. You, you got it. I had to dig deep for I had to dig deep for some K Kzar info right there. <laughs> Did you know? Yeah, I mean... Was the very first Marvel comic. It wasn't a comic. It was a uh, 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 a pulp in 1938. Before. Oh no. Yep, Kzar. It was the ripoff of Tarzan. Of course. In... Yeah, but they couldn't call it that. Right down to having a Z in it, right? Like exactly, yeah. <laughs> Man, Elliot, I, did you have any of your original artwork there handy that you wanted to? Well, I got, I got, I got some. What do you got? What do you got? I don't know. Any more? Uh, oh, here. Here's the, uh, the, okay. okay. So people say, I'll tell, yeah, I, I, I honestly think, Elliot, if you have some of these originals, you should try maybe dipping your toe with one or two in heritage auctions. Because I just have a you know what? feeling that people would want these things. No. Here's here's why. If you take a look at this. It's just oh, I want, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, but it's just floating there. This isn't the page that was printed. This was a, this was the original. Oh. Art. It's static. So it's that's whatever, I, of, there's only one of those. Oh, well, that is true. Yeah, that is true. Oh man, that's wonderful. And here's here's uh here's Daredevil's page with with what yeah. I yeah. Wait a minute, wait wait. Let me let me let me uh do this. Yeah, that's a little better. With what I figured out, what the cane had to do back then. One of my favorite pieces too, right there. The cane for sure. The simple mechanisms of yeah. the classic characters. Spidey's automatic timer mechanism on his camera. Yeah, that was some of my favorite ERB drawings. Oh, thank you. I mean, this is, I've got, that's the trouble. All of this stuff is just loose. Oh, yeah, this one, this, is a, this was Mockingbird's Battle Stage. Yeah, yeah, yes. If someone was really motivated, they could machine this up. Maybe. I don't know anymore. <laughs> it's been too long. Dude, <laughs> nobody puts that kind of level of thought into these things. This was definitely oh, a learning job. That's wonderful, man. I love, I love it. I love it, Elliot. I can't remember what half of these things are either. Well, okay. All right. That's, that's too much fun. Okay, wait a minute, Elliot. I think what we got to do 
is we got to come back. We got to do another show with you just about Handbook of the Marvel Universe and just talking about some okay. focusing on some of those. Will okay. you come back and do that again sometime this year? Next Say the year? word. Say the word. We'll do. All right, Elliot. I got. I have to get out of here. I have some. I have some boring business meetings. I gotta get. Oh to. wait a minute! No, no, I'm just getting warmed up. No, no, you can't do this. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. This is, this is why I love you, and this is why you you were one of my favorite guests. You are now officially again my favorite guest. Very kind. Thank you. You're so very thank very you very so much. You're welcome. Uh, I'm gonna stick. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I gotta give you my outro. I gotta play the closing credits and stuff. Okay. If, if you stick around, if we, we could talk afterwards, if you gotta go, I understand. No, no, I'm I'm okay for now. Go ahead. Okay, this this will take a minute or two, but not too long. Thank you very much, and don't forget elliotarbrown.com, the history oh, yeah. of holding dumb pictures and wonderful pictures. pictures. Yeah, a lot of cool pictures on there. Don't copy those pictures. Elliot doesn't want you copying those pictures off his website. All you have to do is ask. Generally, I say yes. Depends on what for. Just ask there. Okay, thanks, Elliot. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Dan. Wow. Elliot R. Brown. Fantastic. Great interview. Great guy to talk to. Shares a lot of things in common with, with my passions, right? Not just comics, but like, how can you get nerdier than just like liking comics? Like you got to get into like, I like the technical diagrams of Captain America's shield. Like what? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because like, those were the things that everybody kind of like took for granted. Those were the things that Elliot said. No, I can add. So I, I look at these things and I, I filter them through the ERB lens and create, I don't know. I don't want to say reality, but I'm going to say quasi reality. I'm going to say pseudo reality i don't know what you want to call it it's amazing man publishers out there if you're watching and nobody's done the erb retrospective book just think about it okay think about it the guys done a lot we didn't even cover all the stuff he did cartography photography lithography maybe i wouldn't be surprised the guys done a lot um and, and is just a rich part of what it, Marvel is. Marvel Comics is not the same without Elliot R. Brown. Just say it. it. It would still be great, probably. Not as great. Okay. Speed of great. You're great, guys, for watching this book, for sticking with us this long. We got people watching us for two hours and 17 minutes so far. That's pretty long. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for supporting this channel. I want to thank you. Please, please, please. I don't, I'm going to get more into this. I got to ask you, please think about clicking like. Got a lot of people out there that will click dislike before I even go live. Like before the show is even streamed. So like, I don't got to beg for love, like, or whatever. Oh, but I'll do it. Please, please, please consider clicking like, okay? Consider, if you haven't already, consider clicking subscribe. Maybe even click join and look at all the things you could spend money, give me money. And what will I do with that money? I will buy comics. I'll buy the comics that you can't find in other places. You can't go to Barnes and Noble and buy this thing. Oh, it's got that smell. It's got that feel. It's got that flavor. I miss comics. I miss those kind of comics. I miss those days when I could go out and spend. How much did I have to spend on this thing? I don't know. I spent a buck 75 on this thing when it came out. Dude, and I've read it a hundred times at least. And I got so much. And the amount of thought that went into one of these pages is about 10 times as much as goes into almost any other Iron Man book that I've read. Iron Man is one of those books that's really interesting because people that write it usually have no clue about technology. So much so that it really becomes magical Iron Man armor. It's just magic now. You know, it can do whatever. It's got nanotechnology. That's all you got to say. And artificial intelligence and Elliot went that extra while and thought more about it. So I want to thank him. I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody. Stick around next time. Who's coming up next time? I don't know. I've got a bead on it. I've got an invitation out there. I don't have confirmation. It's another guest that we've had here before. In fact, it's a panel of guests, all of whom have been here before, but one in particular. I will just drop one clue that it was my all-time most popular stream ever. 
It's the one that put me over the top for monetizing this channel. And it's a guy who's really cool and nicer than he has any reason to be. We're going to bring him in, hopefully, if it all works out. If not next week, then probably the following week. Either way, we've got more Million Dollar Mailbox coming up. I just got more submissions. If you have not sent your comic in to Million Dollar Mailbox one last time, Comic Book News, Million Dollar Mailbox, P.O. Box 1163, Arcata, California, 95518. Send it in. We'll look at your comics. We'll hype them up because we love nothing more than giving shine to those who deserve it, like L.A.R. Brown. And uh, we will have, if not that amazing panel next week, we'll have somebody. And they'll be here and they'll talk about something. And when will that be? It's going to be that time that we like to call next time. Yeah.